<laughs> okay. We are live. We welcome, are everybody. Live. welcome. Uh it was, it was teething problems as always. I meant to let this up to start off with. It's Geekly Weekly Show with friends and random talky stuff. That's what this is. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, basically every week me, Carl, and Mark are going to invite some people on and uh, hopefully some of you guys will come on at some point. We're going to talk about whatever the crap we want to talk about. Oh, Mark's disappeared, so he's having problems. And uh, we've got a few segments we're planning to put on the show, that kind of thing, like playing little video snippets or maybe just like... We haven't worked it out yet, to be honest, but, you know, we're kind of like fly by the seat of our pants kind of... Uh, uh, outfit really and we just uh make it up as we go along so hopefully over the coming weeks and months we'll uh we'll finesse it and we'll end up with something that's uh somewhat approaching uh, a cool show <laughs> yeah. let us hope let us hope yeah so uh, Mark, mark's in spain he was on here a second ago but we was trying to get him to go from um spin kind of camera to like pro like portrait kind of uh, image and uh, that kind of um that's all gone terribly wrong and he's disappeared now so <laughs> hopefully he'll find his way back on right, yeah so we'll, of, we'll get him back you, in here so. well what do you want to say man because you, you you i started off just saying I, well, I was playing my fallout game i just said i want to i'm going to want to go do a stream showing off my comics and then next week i said you said oh you i'll come and do that and next week i know you're inviting millions of people on and saying oh we get so and so on and so and so and i'm like wow What's going on? I thought I was just going to sit there and show a few comic books off. But uh, yeah, so I mean, we're, we're talking like I wanted to do a regular routine weekly show. You wanted to do a regular routine show, and now I'm all by myself because now the icon is spinning for Graham. What happened? We're losing everybody. <laughs> is there a European earthquake? Oh, am I even still live here, Graham? Oh, Graham. We lost Mark. We lost Graham. If I'm still alive, one of the things I wanted to make sure to do, since this was supposed to be to me yesterday, I had a package coming from Las Vegas. Because I uh, had this run of comics that uh, I tended to give away, especially after I got them autographed and stuff. Oh, Graham, where are you? So, there's a four-part series. i got to get around to packing peanuts here. Look at this. I'm just flying live all by myself here right now. Oh, please be in bags and boards. Good. Because I don't want that tape on. Box of packing peanuts. Let's see what I got going in here. Oh, good Lord. If you won't bring me on now, I am okay. Something snafu'd bad. Here we go. There's Gray. Gray back. back. Mark's back. It's all gone. It's all just to prove that everything that can go wrong, you know, can go wrong. Hey. Uh, uh, my everything went wrong. If, you want, if you want me, it's going to have to be in portrait right today. Um, yeah, no that's worries, right. No worries. That's that's right. Right. We're, we're not worried about it. We didn't invite so, you on for your good looks, so it's all good. <laughs> no one here was invited on for their good looks, exactly. I've got to say. <laughs> I didn't know if you guys could see where I was doing box opening, where I got this package from Las Vegas. I don't, I don't, we're, we're starting off with that. I'll just hear you want to come in soon. When, when do you want to come well, in? Well, that's in what I was going to say. I just want to show off what came in the box. Right, let me put you on full screen then. Okay. I'd given so many of these away. I wanted the full series. I wanted to put them up behind me. Did you do that already? Oh, plastic man. So I went nice. ahead and got the series. I just got them in the mail. There we go. Yeah. I just got the four issue series in the mail and I wanted to put it up behind me because it was supposed to be here yesterday, but just got here today. But that's what I was going to put behind me there. Right. To go with the art that's there, so you know, I kind of figured I'd do the introduction of my friend. I'm going to show you. I put a little a little clip together of uh, some of his some just really quick, just some of his uh, some of his covers that he's done, just so people can see them. Beauty. Oh.
There you go. Very quick. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. a little, just a little thing for people to see. If they're not aware of his act. <laughs> to be honest, I was totally unaware. You said we were going to get Hilary Bartle, and I'm like, I don't know who that is. Then I'm useless at knowing people anyway, so I'm terrible. I'm the worst person for knowing creators. <laughs> Ask me about the characters, and I know I could tell you, but the yeah, I, I have to useless. say. Um... Yeah, I have to say, um, I wouldn't. I didn't know Hilary Barter by name, but I definitely know some of those uh, covers. Yeah, and that's quite often yeah. the case. I don't where, know if he did you know, all those particular covers, but he worked. No, on I, all don't those books, he so. I don't okay. think he did SpongeBob yeah, one. I don't think he did SpongeBob. Yeah, the reason I had that nine eight in there like that is because his name is actually in the thing where he's one of the artists in there because oh, okay. that's the easiest way to do it. So I, I the original the art that, that you sent me, Kyle. So uh, any image is incorrect there, it's all down to Kyle because that's the ones he it sent is, me. It, <laughs> any clubs today, it's on me, time and screw-ups, it's this, on this me. Is, this is going to, yeah, exactly, this is how the show is going to work. I, anything good on the show, I'm going to take full responsibility for any mess-ups, it's going to be Mark or Kyle's fault. Them two yeah. bars, yeah. but you know. Okay. That's the, that's but you can't go wrong <laughs> with these. I had to have a full set again since I've given away all of mine prior. So I'm going to put these behind me. So uh, shall we cool. bring in the guest of honor? Yeah. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I've actually got Plastic Man number one in, in a box somewhere. I've Just not in Spain with run. you. Not that plastic <laughs> man run. I've probably got the one that Hillary bought. I didn't do any work on, but uh, I'm not too sure. So shall we? are you ready to come on, Hillary? Uh, we've got thumbs up, so drum roll. Who's got the drums for the drum roll? Anyone got the drum? No. There you go. Hey, welcome. Welcome to our calamitous stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to describe it at the moment. Yeah, so far, I, I've gone missing. Mark's gone missing. Uh, yeah, but it's, we'll, we'll see what happens. At least, at least Hillary is here. To ask, no, ask well, we are in and out okay i'm just gonna be here and then i'll be gone and right <laughs> so nice, you guys yeah yeah that'll keep us uh keep us on our toes definitely <laughs> all right who wants to start off the question i mean i like to go back to the history like where how did you get into art and like realize you could draw or did you have to really sort of thrash it out and teach yourself or was it just a natural no, not, some natural talent must be there surely well um I think I just drew as a kid, like every kid does, and um, thankfully I had uh, parents that would encourage that. I've talked to other artists that had, you know, their their life was essentially fighting against uh, an authority figure like a father who would rip up their sketchbooks and throw them in the fireplace, and that, you know, art was for pansies, that kind of nonsense. Um, so I had the opposite of that. They encouraged me, and... Um, you know, I, I just drew. So um, I didn't start thinking about comics until probably high school. Um, and uh, I started buying the comics of other kids that were getting rid of their comics, that kind of thing, you know. And, That's a good way to do it. Cheaper. Yeah, they, yeah, they were unloading them. But I remember sitting in high school, and I think it was called Graphis Annual. It was a European magazine, and it had a comics issue. And they had a certain amount of American artists in there. Maybe Eisner is, maybe, might have been one of the first times I saw the spirit and color, perhaps. But also other European artists. And I was like, wow, this is comics is more than what I thought it was. It, it's more than just Marvel and, um, and DC and whatever was on the newsstand. And that was, that was kind of an eye-opening thing. And so at some point after high school, I started, or during and after, I started thinking, maybe I want to do this, you know. So was you not into the was you into the Marvel and DC as well? Or was it the other ones like the, uh, the well, I, just, I remember it uh, some years after I had done it, I found in a box that I joined the MMS Society, uh, uh, you know, the Mary Marvel Marching Society. I had forgotten all about that. I think when I was a very young kid, my older brothers would buy certain marbles, and I would just clip out the advertisements and you know cut cut right into the comic book and send in for something like that. Um, but we didn't have m many comics around the house. But when I got a little older, uh, after church, my dad would drive us to, uh, we'd go to the newsstand on the swing and on the way home in the car. And he'd, he'd give me money for the paper and cigarettes for him. And then he'd give me a quarter to buy a comic. And at that time, the best buy for a quarter were those Marvel annuals and the giant size specials. So 
you know, I got, an, you know, Jack Kirby on the Fantastic Four, uh, Thor, you know, John Buscema doing Thor, that kind of stuff. It was just, it was a great time to be just a casual reader. And wow. uh, I think the most dramatic comic I ever read probably was uh, <clears throat> the FF annual where they have to go to the negative zone. Sue's going to have the baby. And I don't know if you got uh, Okay. Yeah, no, fine, yeah. He's got the number. And, and <laughs> It was so dramatic. It was so, uh, you know, this this dimension spanning epic of, and yet it was also about saving the life of a, a mother and child. So, yeah, you know, that was like, wow, comics are really fun, you know. That's probably like 1968, I'm guessing, around right about that time, was it? 1968? Sounds about right. Sounds about right. I would have been like junior high or a little younger or something. 67. 67, okay. Because the uh, reason I was thinking, because I got a comic for my birthday from 69, and they had the boy, but they hadn't named him yet. They hadn't named the baby yet. So I thought, that's why I thought maybe 68, but never mind. <laughs> just a yeah. guess. Did you have a favorite character like that you used to practice your drawing on or just anything? Well, you know, I didn't, I mean, I honestly didn't do a lot of that. Like I said, I didn't really think about doing it as an artist. And I, I really didn't draw a lot of comics uh, when I was younger. But one of the things I found in looking back at old stuff in the house, uh, my parents at home, uh, was a um, the comic that I did in grade school. And it was essentially the, um, <laughs> it was based on the Batman TV show, you know, with Adam West and all that. So there's like a, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but there's a panel with power blam, probably like the opening uh, titles on that show. And, you know, characters are flying around and, it was almost like some weird abstract pop art thing because I didn't understand how to draw it. Be a decoupage. Something like that. <laughs> but but it was, you know, it was wacky. Uh, but that's like the only comic I have from that, those early days before I was actually in earnest trying to draw like everybody else, you know. When did you sort of start thinking to yourself, oh, actually, I could do this for a job? Well, I think, I think, I don't know about the job part, but when once I saw that, annual like graphics uh, magazine thing you know i started getting interested in comics then and so i, I would go to these local they were swap meets it was, uh, before they were conventions and i'd meet people that were buying and selling comics a good friend of mine george hagenauer was selling me back issues of spider-man you know i have spider-man early issues of the Ditko issues and stuff and i was just buying these as a collector and i thought i would get into it but i didn't really focus on it too well i it wasn't until I started <clears throat> taking art classes that I'd you know, like have a project and I'd be trying to do a, a comic story as a project or something. But I wasn't one of those kids when they were a teenager, they were going to New York and, you know, getting published. I, whenever I read stories about Bernie Wrightson or anybody else that was 15 or 16 and they're already getting published in, <clears throat> in the professional comics, I thought, man, I am a late bloomer here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So what about your I'm, first professional? I was saying, when did you sort of first sell your art? And is that a massive thing for you? Was it like exciting? And yeah, well, Chicago was a really great uh, place to be a fan because there was a, a Chicago. Well, the swap meets evolved into what became the Chicago Comic Con, and for the first, I don't know how many years, but with the original owners of that show, the guys that started it up, there were three local guys in Chicago. It was a, a wonderful show. It was all about comics. This is before the movie actors and the models and the, you name it, professional wrestlers and all those idiots started taking over what comic books have, uh, comic book conventions have become. So in the early years, it was, you would go there and be artists and writers of comics and you could meet them. And these guys who ran the show made Artist Alley this really open and today I guess inclusive would be the word. Anybody who was an artist that was doing comics could get a table for free. So fan artists like myself, when I was starting out and guys doing mini comics would be in artist alley. And, you know, at another table would be professionals. They might, they might've put the, the fans, uh, you know, together in a certain area, but we were all in what was artist alley. And that was kind of astonishing. But even before I was doing that, I could just walk up and, talk to different artists and show them my work. God forbid, you know, they, <laughs> I, I got a, I showed my work to Will Eisner one time. 
<laughs> because I wasn't doing comics, he, he just looked at it and said, well, you know, these are illustrations. I, I really don't feel uh, like I can do a, a critique of illustrations. But if you showed me comics, then I could tell you about comics. So, but uh, I, I eventually I, I showed my stuff um, one year. You know, I'd been doing fan work and um, inking mostly. And I'm doing my own illustrations. And then I showed my work to uh, Al Milgram, who was set up at, at the show. And he said, well, you you're not doing comics here. So I guess you're looking for work as an inker. I said, sure. And uh, <laughs> that's how I got my first gig was uh, a couple pages of Marvel. I got my little pinky in the door there. <laughs> Wikipedia says that uh, one of your first pieces was inking uh, the backup story in Giant Size X-Men. Well, that would have been a little bit later, but yes, that, that I was totally unprepared for any of this. I mean, I had no experience. I'd never, you know, I had I, never been like an assistant to an inker. So I, I was I was pretty darn nervous. And, and, and the first few months and, and jobs I did were pretty awful. And it, um, at some point I had a, a learning curve that started kicking in. But <clears throat> yeah, that, that job, I, th I wish I had gotten about five years later. You know. Okay. Yeah. I didn't fish out the copy of it, but it's not actually the 1975 first print giant size X-Men. It's the 1982, 83 reprint uh, where you okay. get the backup story and the reproduction of it, which is over here. You know, I didn't fish it out, but yeah. Anyway, it was, it was that was the first artist I inked at Marvel. Uh, I, I, again, I inked a few friends of mine in semi-pro or fan zines. I inked some stuff for, just imagine maybe anyway local sort of publications and i was trying to get into fanzines i got into rbcc uh the defenders was the that's the first two pages i inked were in there yeah i don't know how i got another job after that but i uh, eventually <laughs> I did. I did the, the defenders and then like you said i did that uh, dave cochran uh, story and then sometime after that probably a couple of years after i did the first two pages I got a regular gig inking on the thing. And that was that. Then I was off as an, you know, and running as an inker. And, um, you know, it, uh, that was what I did for the first 10 years or, or so, you know. So I've always wondered is there a sort of hierarchy? So who's, who's at the top of the tree? Is it the writer? Is it the, is it the pen guy with the pencils? Is it the guy the inking or the it's guy lettering? <laughs> well, really, it's the letterer. Yeah, you know. gonna... <laughs> it's the editor. Make your work illegible. You know, we can change the spelling and make it look. Legible. No, I mean, yeah. you know, clearly, it's not the inker generally. I mean, sometimes inkers are stars, but um, uh, usually it's the writers and, and the pencilers that are the big names. And yeah, um, yeah. you know, and, and and they sell the books and they they get the the fans. Though I there are cl clearly are exceptions with inkers, and there are inkers that really take over a project in, in terms of the visuals anyway. Mm. You know, guys like Claus yeah. Jansen and, yeah. and, and, and a few other guys would really make it their own, you know, and, and, and some pencilers want that. They're looking for that. Yeah. Was there any memorable mishaps in the early days? Were you mishaps? Oh, sure. I remember in the thing, in one panel, I gave him knuckles. Now he was wearing gloves, but I, I, just like an idiot, I, I I put the bumps there as if the thing had knuckles, which of course he does not. <laughs> he's all knuckles in a way, but he's but yeah, he's exactly. <laughs> so that, that yeah. was one of the dumbest things I did. No, there, there's there's you know lots of goofy things would happen where you just you know I would ha I have no idea what's going on in the pencilers uh, in the pencils in somebody in some case and have to call up the office and say. Does this guy was this guy burned in a fire? And they're like, no, that's just how he draws, you know. <laughs> Gosh, that's all good. So when you so, get like um, a job, sorry, you go, Mark, you go. Yeah, I was going to say. So you must you must get it so that there's somebody who you prefer to work with as a, as an inker. There must be somebody who does the pencils that you sort of click with. And you oh, form sure. a, a really good partnership with. Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, to me, I've always seen inkers. There's kind of two kinds of inkers generally. There's inkers that will just make it their own and change it. I mean, Wally Wood is one of my favorite artists, period. But as an inker, you know, he would 
with rare exception, he would almost start over and erase the pencils. Uh, I think Steve Ditko might have been one of the few might have been one of the few guys whose work he respected enough to to kind of keep the feel of it, even though he had to spin it. <laughs> but um, but you know, I I seldom did that sort of work. Most of the pencilers I work with didn't need it, but they certainly didn't want me to. No. Write the law. So no. <laughs> then it's all about compatibility of styles, and you know I. Uh, Kieran Dwyer is a friend of mine. I just saw him for the first time in years. <clears throat> he he was his stuff is just so beautiful. I'm you know when I'm working with him or John Bogdanov or any of the guys that I really was simpatico with, I would just yeah. my mantra was don't screw it up. Right, you just try to get it on on paper as best you can, capture what they want, what they're doing, and not yeah not screw it up. Yeah. Have you got I'm a favorite? In, t in terms of payment, was it, I presume you were just paid per job. It was just sort of like, this is so much per page or whatever. It, well, page rate is exactly right. Um, I don't know if anybody had, you know, there might have been certain artists that had contracts back then, but generally that was not the case until many, many years later. Yeah. No, it was, yeah. it was page rate. And part of the game for me is when I started, you know, after I'd done it for a few years, I realized there is absolutely no structure here for a raise, you know? Wow. So yeah, know. <laughs> the only way to get a raise would be to ask for it. And the only way to have leverage is what I would do is an editor would call me up from DC after I'd been working at Marvel and he, and I, and yeah. can you beat my Marvel rate? Uh, yeah. You back to Marvel, yeah. you say, can you beat my DC rate? And so you might get a $5 raise every time. But that was the only real way I ever got a raise anywhere. Uh, yeah. So you so you were you were basically freelance. You you worked for whoever paid the highest rate. Yeah. I never I never was under contract with any company. But no. when I was an inker, I don't think those contracts existed. There might have been exclusive no. deals. Again, they weren't offered to me, so I don't know mm -hmm. about. Them. But in my case, no, I I'd never been under contract. So, um, but you know, when you got a regular yeah. book and you're doing a monthly or something or a bi-monthly. You've got steady work, but it's there's no guarantee they can't just boot you tomorrow. So. There's certainly no health insurance. <laughs> no. <laughs> Which is a shame. <laughs> no. Yeah, but that's changed, and they, they have contracts now that different people, uh, you know, they'll guarantee you a certain amount of work, uh, you know, in the course of a year, and, and I think that, that you might get insurance or other things based on that. <clears throat> Don't quote me on the details because I've never I've never done that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Before we go down another road, Graham, you want to acknowledge who we got in chat and what's going on there, and oh, say yeah, hi to my grandnephew Elijah. And yeah, we've got, well, at the moment we got a few people watching. But Gary B's here. Metarog is here. Triple G. Hi, Reader six 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 is here as well. Um, Frugal Mama is here. And uh, who else? I think that's it. Oh, I um, yeah, that's cool. so far. Yeah, that's what we've got in. That's who's that's who's talking anyway. We and also your is your grandson was it? That's my grand nephew. Who I grand gave nephew. a thousand comic books to. So yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say, um, have you got like a favorite character to draw? Well, my favorite superhero was always Plastic Man. Once I discovered Jack Cole's work, uh, I just, you know, I, I I always loved artists before I loved characters. And I, when, as a very young reader, I was I was a Marvel guy, and you know that's that that's pretty simple. But uh, but it was really uh, care, you know, artists. And Jack Cole was one of the funniest. Uh, yeah, well, that's my version uh, with Doug Rice and Phil Folio. That's that's my version of Plastic Man. Um, and we did try to pay homage to Jack Cole uh, in the original version of Plastic Man in the 1940s. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, you know, when I got a chance to actually create a character, it was Flash Brannigan. And for me, it's not the same character as, as, as Plastic Man, but it is very much a, a similar character in the same sort of humorous superhero genre where he's also a, a shape changing character. Um, okay, and, and definitely my study and love of Jack Cole and Harvey Kurtzman and uh, Mad and all that stuff informed, you know, when I drew both Plastic Man and uh, oh, there's John Bishop. Hey, John Bishop. 
So what, what time is it? Going. He's, he said it's an evening oil. What uh, what time is it? Uh, it's uh, half past seven in the evening in the UK. Not too late. Not too late. Evening, late yeah. uh, and then what? It's half past eight um, there where you're in Spain, Mark? Yeah, it's half eight there in Spain, yeah. Yeah. But you don't go out to Still dinner in early. Spain until like 10.30, but, right? You go out to yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, they don't eat, the restaurants don't even open till 8 30. So <laughs> you go out to a restaurant here, you're not getting any food much before 9 30. I just assume, like in Italy and really Spain, nobody really goes to work. Like in America, we got this crazy, you know, everyone slaves away nine to five. They probably don't get into work or they're not, they're not sober or awake until they've been at work for two hours. <laughs> you know? Which is yeah. probably a fun way to live, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I used to hear those stories about uh, Italian film sets, like when, you know, a guy, a guys like, you know, the, uh, Clint Eastwood went over to make the spaghetti westerns. He said, you'd have to get all the work done in the yeah. morning. The lunch would be, you know, vino and pasta, and nothing happened after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, nothing, everything closes down here between about uh, two o'clock and uh, four o'clock in the night. You just can't get anything. To, it, just everybody's having a siesta. I don't know what's going on. Right. Mm. Right. Uh, Steve Reed's asking about your work with Bongo Comics. Did you do some work for Bongo Comics? Yeah, yeah. Some big stuff. That's mm. in more, you know, sort of in the tail end when I was doing the, a lot of published work. Uh, I work for uh, Bongo would be the Simpsons line of books. Oh yeah, they sort of brought me in there when when I when I first started working there, they still had a kind of a tight rein. Or when they certainly when they started, they were trying to go for that animated look on the books, and it had a kind of dead weight style. So I wouldn't really fit in there because I don't draw that way. And uh, Andrew Peepoy was almost the house inker there. He hundreds and hundreds of pages, and on different stories, he would kind of push and say, "Hey." let's try something a little different here on this story. And he was the guy that got them to loosen up the look a little bit and to add a little more comic booky life to, you know, to make it less formulaic in terms of the art and the line work. So, so once they did that, um, I could actually do work for their regular titles. But prior to that, I could really only work on radioactive man and uh, uh, the, um, the tree house of horror, which was, the Treehouse of Horror is easily was my favorite gig in comics. At that time. <laughs> you know, you're just doing these humorous EC inspired horror stories was great. They're brilliant. They're tied to Twilight Zone in there and all popular tropes. Oh, they well, they threw everything in there. You know, Ian, <laughs> Boothby, Ian Boothby was a pretty regular writer. I inked some, uh, I drew some of his stuff. When I got to my first Treehouse story, I did myself, and it was wasn't even a story. It was just limericks with artwork. And I think you guys showed uh, a page from that alphabet of limericks. Uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. And you got uh, Triple G. What's today? Have you got a favorite piece of your own work? Your favorite ever picture or something, or comic maybe? Oh, I, I you know, I, I, I used to say one of my favorites, and it just came up recently because I posted some drawing. I do like a, a drawing every week, usually, and get it on the internet. And uh, somebody said, "Oh, looking at this drawing." I somehow put it together that you were the guy that did that story back in A1 called The Competition. And like somehow this guy remembered a story I did decades ago. Uh, you know, it was a British comic called uh, A1. And I did a one-off story that was one of my favorite things. It was a black and white story with do a shade board. You know what that is. And um, actually it was an old Munden's bar script. It was a script that I, a story anyway, that I had, a plot I'd come up with for Munnan's Bar. And then when I didn't use it there, I just did it as uh, a standalone story in A1. And I, I always thought that was one of the better things I did. Yeah. Cool. Got another question. This is making it easy. People are asking, people are asking questions in the chat. If you could have any comic book, what would it be and why, Mr. Barter? He's very polite, old cat. Well, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't really covet uh, issues of comics. There's plenty of comics I can't afford to buy, certainly. And I would love to have Christine, you know, uh, mile high versions of, of old comics just to see what they look like without rats having chewed the corner. Because <laughs> almost every old comic I bought was just, you know, was falling to shreds. 
But so that would be fun to see. But I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have one comic, but you know, any of the any of the old uh, uh, comics from the fifties, you know, the yeah. uh, the EC comics that Wood had drawn uh, in the nineteen forties. If I could have some of that, the I do have Jack Cole books. I was able to buy some of that stuff. I bought a lot of police comics, but to have them in like super mint condition would be great. Just to just so they wouldn't stink when you were reading them, you know. <laughs> Bits fall <laughs> off and so. <stuff. laughs> oh, yeah. I, I took that question to mean what working on any book. I thought you meant if you had any book, you could choose any book to work on. What well, you know, would it be? I think that's. I gotta say, I gotta about. say, you know, the one superhero comic I wanted to draw, I did, which was Plastic Man. That was the All only right. thing I wanted to do. Um, I pitched things that haven't flown. You know, I pitched doing other characters, but. I don't, you know, yeah, no, I don't have a lot of regrets that I didn't get this book at that. When I was an inker, I was always trying to get on, you name it, the X book that, that made royalties because yeah, all the money in comics that I made was back in the days that there were royalties. Uh, was, okay, there you go. I, I so prefer that yours. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I guess I inked that particular one or part of it. Yeah. <laughs> back then, I would, you know, and, and inked Wolverine 50, and yeah. <laughs> you, you know what was crazy as an inker is that Marvel used to do things like uh, they'd give you something, they, they, they'd they call you on a Friday and say, you know, can you ink a couple of pages? Of, how many pages could you ink over the weekend? Because they, the, they needed the book in on Monday and the regular inker was late. And so you'd say, you know, two or three or whatever. And they'd, they'd FedEx them to you. you get them on Saturday. And then you had to ship them off on Sunday or, or maybe Monday morning if you were lucky. But they called it combat pay. They'd give you like rate right and a half over the weekend. <laughs> and I, heard, I heard from other inkers that they discontinued that practice, that they, they no longer paid extra for that. Right. My like, hazardous duty in combat pay was a little different than that. <laughs> I can imagine. There, there was very little gun actual gunplay involved. Mm. In my combat pay. No PTSD either, I hope. <laughs> well, some of those easy jobs I had PTSD, but again, not 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 the same. <laughs> yeah, cool. I've got another question about working with Alan Moore. What did you work with Alan Moore on? I'm sorry, Alan. Who? I never heard of the guy. What? Yeah, yeah. I know. did he I'll, do I'll comics? Be- I've been told he, he bears a passing resemblance to me, as I've been told a few times. But uh, other than that, I don't know who he is. Well, that's that's who I um, created Splash Brannigan with. Uh, okay, it was Alan's concept for the character, and uh, the early, I mean, the only thing I have to say about Splash, besides the fact that it was a blast, I love. I mean, I, you know, the stories were brilliant. I, I had already been a fan of Alan's work, um, but the fact that he was writing like six different characters at the same time and keeping track of them all, and feeding pages to different artists in different countries and. It's, ston- it's kind of astonishing because he would literally write a couple of pages for me. He'd write a- then he'd turn around and, you know, the editor would, Scott Dunbeer would say, Alan, you know, this guy, you know, this guy needs a couple of pages uh, on Tom Strong and he'd have to write a couple of pages. And somehow the stories all work together. Um, they, you know, it wasn't just, just goofy, crazy, make it up as you go along. Alan had, has some kind of brain that functions at a level that um, I don't I don't understand because I can barely write one story at a time. <laughs> um, but but my, my, my own contribution to the character besides drawing it was Alan's original concept was great. Um, this guy's you know made out of three-dimensional ink and he saw him as a kind of a crazy cat. If you remember crazy cat in the animated cartoons or the out of the Big ink- yeah the or the out of the inkwell cartoons. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the yeah the, the the animated crazy cat, um, but where he would you know draw with his magic pencil he would draw a picture uh, draw a frame on the wall, and then it was a, he's you know he's running he's just trying to escape a monster or something, he would draw a square on the wall and then he could dive through it and it was a window. He would sort of create things with his magic pencil. And Alan had this idea that he, this guy would be like kind of like a Flash Gordon type, with a utility belt with a rapidograph, you know, in a holster on his belt. And he saw him as this guy who would then draw things. And I think he was really trying to flash branding and into the act of art making. And that I think would have been a great idea on its own. But I said, well, Alan, if he's made out of ink, he doesn't really need an ink gun. You know, <laughs> he is ink. He just draws with his hand. He, and, and, and so 
that was my kind. Alan liked the idea, and we kind of went that way. But I, I still, I, I'm curious if someone will ever do the other one. <laughs> It'll be kind of fun. Okay, that's interesting. I, I don't feel like for some reason I've, I thought I'd heard of a name called Crash Brannigan, but I don't know if there's any, I must have heard Splash Brannigan, got it mixed up with somebody else or something. I don't know. Sure, uh, I heard that name. There's a Crash a Corrigan. Oh, uh, maybe. There's a Crash Bandicoot as well, which is a game. So I think I was just getting my head all mixed up. Yeah, now, has he got any questions? Any more questions, Mark? Oh, can you hear us? Are you in the back yet, yeah, Mark? I'm not sure you can hear us. I'm back, oh, but um, oh, he's back. my connection is quite poor. So, okay. Uh, did, did, you any, did you have any more I questions? I wanted to segue oh. something here because we talked about something yeah, a minute ago so. with his favorite piece of artwork. And his favorite artwork to me is over my shoulder okay. that he did for our family here. But my ultimate favorite piece of Hillary Barta art is a piece of SpongeBob he did for my grandson, which coolest thing in the world i'm still not a spongebob fan all that much but coolest <laughs> thing in the world to me that he did that for my grandson and i kind of wanted to use that to segue into mark's because mark has this story that i'm gonna sit back and i'm just gonna laugh when you do talk yeah, about so <laughs> so for me when i collect comics i like collecting for three reasons one reason is uh the story another reason is the art and another reason is uh an investment so the best comics for me is where all three come together. So I like the art, I like the story, and they're a good investment. So about two years ago, I decided that I'd buy SpongeBob number one because I really liked SpongeBob, thought the artwork was good, and I thought it was a good investment. So I bought it, and my daughters thought this was really funny, that there was here, there was their retired father who was buying SpongeBob square pants comics so um i bought number one and i put it away and it was a good investment um anyway the uh for that christmas my daughters uh they sort of gave me a present and i thought what's this and it was comic shapes and they never like comics so i thought it's going to be comics and i thought what have they bought me and they bought me another five spongebob comics <laughs> so the problem with that was that because I'm a collector, I can I can live with having one. But the problem is I then had one, two, four, and seven, I think. And um, that was it. I just said, okay, I now have to buy all 85 <laughs> of the SpongeBob comics. Uh, that's a <laughs> so I now have, I do have, I now have all but eight of oh. the 85 SpongeBob comics. Well so, and I love them to bits. I mean, they, they just make me laugh. I love the simple, the simple, clean humor, the character based humor. Um, and I think, have you, did you do one of the covers, Hillary? Um, I don't think I ever worked on a cover. I did have a, I, I, a back cover of one of the issues, which was a strip I wrote, the, one of the only things, yeah. the, the only thing I wrote there. Um, no, so I haven't done any covers that I, unless I'm forgetting something, I don't believe so. The, you know, There's the, one, I think it was issue 20, that when I type in your name into Google and SpongeBob, it comes up with this particular image. Um, well, you know, so. the thing is, in terms of searching, depends on who enters the data in there, right? So it's not yeah. always. Generally, what they'll do is if you draw something in a book and you go and search for that artist and that character. They'll show you the issue. That doesn't mean you drew the cover, especially in no, an yeah. There's five yeah. artists in the book. There's one artist on the cover. It's not always the guys inside. So, you know, um, but uh, yeah, a SpongeBob, you know, one of, the, one of my favorite things about SpongeBob, besides the fact that, you know, they hired me. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, uh, the, the editor, Chris Duffy, and uh, you know, along with the, the creator of SpongeBob, Steve Hillenberg. Yeah. They, they didn't do what Bongo did, for instance. Bongo, when it started, like I said, they were very rigid in how those characters were drawn down to the ink line. It had to be this dead weight line. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. They were like, oh, we have to tie it in with the animated show. They didn't do that with SpongeBob. There were certain artists. No, it's all over yeah. the place. Well, yeah, it, lots it, of they treated it like a genuine comic book where you would say in the 1940s where different people could draw in their own yeah. style. Uh, they did have several yeah. artists usually that 
who worked on the show, Jay Lender, and, and there's an, a number of guys that were regulars that worked in Hollywood in animation, and they 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 had the look down, but they exaggerated it more. They did the things you can yeah. do in comic books, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, it's one of the things I like about the series is that, is that there is loads of different styles in there. I mean, one of my favourite covers is a Bill Sankovitz cover, um, you know, and it, it it's uh, it, it, I think it's a great series. And um, you know, there were very small print runs, only five six thousand each print run, I think. And you know, it was a kids' comic, so you know, a lot of those would have gone got destroyed. So um, yeah, so, so I, you're seeing this my is a Right, <laughs> yeah, there's not so many of them, I suppose. Yeah, is this the one you're talking about, Mark? Twenty, did you say? Spider-Man Twenty? No, it's not what that one. Oh, it's it's one where one. there's lots no. of little, there's lots of little different creatures on the cover. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was going to try and find yeah, it. That is SpongeBob Yeah, but it's not the right one, is it? I've got, I've got different... a box of them somewhere here, but I can't. <laughs> that. Are you are you a SpongeBob fan, or did you become a fan when you got to work on it, or? No. Oddly enough, I don't have a cable TV. It was on. It was on whatever you call it now, cable, uh, not regular old free TV that old old skin flints like me watch. And um, so when Chris Duffy, the editor, asked me if I would do something, he said, "Well, I'll send you a video." And so he, you know, he sent me a video, and I watched it. And the first thing I had to do is get up and turn the volume down on the TV because it was easily the loudest. <laughs> show i'd ever heard <laughs> you know like the opening song everyone is screaming <laughs> but i i started to you know i really appreciate it i remember watching there's one episode where spongebob and uh uh what uh, what's his name the uh starfish patrick. Uh, patrick patrick um they run away from home essentially and they're off in the you know it's like the equivalent of the desert they're off in the uh, on the sea bottom somewhere and you know so they <laughs> Nighttime comes, and so they decide to make a fire. And they're sitting around their little campfire, and they kind of look at each other. Wait a minute, we're 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 underwater, and then the fire <laughs> the fire disappears. <laughs> and it's just it's, <laughs> those sort of bits that that the sort of surreal or fourth wall bits were kind of amusing. Um, but it's a you know it's a genuinely funny show, and it, its heart is definitely in the right place. You know, it's kind of a a sweet show. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I enjoy, what, I, one of my favorite. Never got to do one of my favorite. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, one one of my favorite SpongeBob covers. I I can't remember any, any, the, the the waters draining out of um out of the sea, and SpongeBob and Patrick are sort of the, the sea's has gone away, and uh, SpongeBob goes, "Oh no, the sea has gone away," and Patrick goes, "We were underwater." <laughs> Patrick and Hassan, you know, it was a big well, news yeah. to him that they were underwater. There's a I mean, squirrel. So there's a squirrel that lives inside like a fishbowl, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a very goofy. There's very goofy uh, aspects to the show that are, you know, I, I mean, when you're a kid, you don't really think about that stuff. But then when you're like an adult watching the thing with your kids, you go, "Oh God, this this works on several levels of." of <laughs> They have got crazier cartoons, haven't they? They've got but, so surreal, I, some of them now. Oh, yeah. But can, I, can I ask how on earth you got involved in drawing for Core and Buster? Yeah, I don't know about them. I don't know. I mean, I got a call from the editor, and that was it. It was one of those <laughs> things where, like, Hillary, would you like to do a story for us? Oh, wait a minute. No, I do know. Um, uh, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of mine uh, was doing stuff for them, and, uh, and, and I think mentioned my name. I, so word of mouth, you know, having friends helps. I mean, I, yeah. you know, all, when I was an inker, you'd go to conventions every year and half of your job in a way was making friends with everybody else. Cause you know, Smoothie. If there's a face attached to the name. It might help. And yeah, uh, definitely. Is that your first UK comic work then? Well, a one I had done before it. I mentioned oh, yeah. that. Um, uh huh. Yeah. I, you know, other than reprints, I'm not sure how much, if any, uh, you know, stuff was uh, UK originally, you know, published in the UK. I think I think I think those might have been the two jobs. So, yeah, no, I don't know why they haven't they haven't hired me. But uh, apparently I don't go and schmooze enough with 
key editor. So. <laughs> so what did you do from those? Did you, did you ink them, like just individual stories or? Well, all I did, you know, was literally one job. I wish I had kind of prepared for this. I would have pulled out the art. It was uh, Kid Kong. All right. You know, the yeah, King yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I remember him. King Kong and Granny uh, go to a museum <laughs> and smash everything up. And yeah. I, I think some mad uh, curator of the museum turns a like, like creates a monster. I, I, I like a Frankenstein monster, but somehow it's a dinosaur. Yeah, it's some kind of well, they bring a that maybe they just bring one of the dinosaurs to life, one of the models or skeletons or something. Hey, Thinking about yes, I, hang on. he squeezes the dinosaur. This is what I remember most about the story because it took some working out between me and the editor. But he squeezes the dinosaur and like a banana, his insides come pop out of the skin. It was one of the weirder images I've ever had to draw. I think it was called the Bananasaurus. <laughs> I don't don't ask me how they did that. But yeah, that's one of the weirdest things because we're like, how do I draw this? And I remember when you first squeezed it, it looked like, well, let's just say a giant phallus, you know, oh, it's, gosh. It's a giant banana coming out of it. We we had to we had to kind of reposition it a few times. I think. <laughs> Fine. It was a kid's book after all. Yeah. It's that I was thinking about it. the old UK comic books are kind of like this strange, surreal humor of the, the modern comic uh, cartoons. Like, uh, we, we say cartoons. the cartoons nowadays we say the cartoons nowadays are really <laughs> surreal, but uh there's kind of our old UK comic books are just the same, wouldn't they, Mark? Well, there seems to be a real knock, at least in that core buster book, a real knockabout kind of farce like thing going on. A lot of mm. a lot of physical comedy and which is which is lovely to draw, um, you know, nonstop action. I mean, when you when they give you strips, basically people talk, even if it's funny talk. It's not that funny drawing it. I remember doing Splash Branding, and I would just come up with things to do while characters are talking. You know, um, Plastic Man, same thing. It's like, what can I do? What can I do differently with Plastic Man's neck or whatever? You know, what what shape or whatever? What what can we? How can we make this? More than just people. Yeah, yeah. So many yeah, I think I you see what I regret at the moment is that I think there's a lack of funny, funny books. You know, everything's superhero. You know, uh, SpongeBob is finished. Um, I think there's one Scooby Doo title still going, but you know, where, where's um, where's stupid? Where's not Brand Eck? Where's well, um, stupid? They're stupid for you. You're talking about from the majors, and the problem is, is that. They cultivate a certain type of reader. Uh, there are other readers out there, but and there are other publishers doing humor. And the biggest growth in comic books is in these um, books written for younger readers now. And they, they just bypass the comic book marketplace. They go to its books, book publishers, and bookstores. And these kids are huge fans of these authors, yeah. and most of them are humorous. Most, of, I think, I think the majority of them are humorous books and they're you know they're just not the kind of stuff we're talking about they're not the traditional four color they're usually black and white and, and but you know they're you've seen them the smaller books and they're they're like you know yeah many little graphic novels if not one story but a lot of a lot of short stories and games and that sort of thing i think that's that's where the growth is you know superheroes really i hate to say it but they're more like a you know an ip farm for hollywood now you mm -hmm. know it, and that's why you know, a lot of the scripts are characters talking. They they write these things as if they're going to be played by actors. They're not comic books. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm generalizing here. There's plenty of exceptions, but um, it's not a good comic book that doesn't move. You know, it's it's not it's not doing what comics do well. Okay, just yeah. go back a little yeah. bit. Uh, sorry, Roger's got a question in the chat. Was it, what's it like? What was it like working over Ron Wilson's pencils? Well, you know, that was my literal first regular job. Was I first inked Don Perlin on on the Defenders? I think Kyle held up a copy of that. But um, and one of those, if I'm not mistaken, the writer that you guys are featuring uh, uh, wrote wrote Jay the and Demetrius right there. there. You go. Same book. So we're tying it all back in together here. Um, uh, Ron, but inking Don Perlin and then Ron. It really felt like I was inking Marvel comics because, 
you know, Don Perlin kind of was an old time guy and Ron was a younger artist, but he really, he just wanted to draw smash him up superhero stuff and did it, you know, did it reasonably well, but his, his figures were all kind of hefty and um, he had his own, his own take on it. Um, but it was fun. No, it was great. I mean, just, just, just being in comics, having work was kind of amazing. I don't know how it happened. I just like, I would, I consider myself very lucky that I wasn't fired after the first few jobs I did and mm. I never worked again. Cause I didn't know what I was doing, but. Um, did you yeah. ever get any like good encouragement or any bad like critiques from anyone you worked with in the early oh, days? Yeah, or ever? Sure. You get, I got both. Mostly it was positive because editors that want to work with you and see your potential. Uh, you know, Carl Potts would have been that guy at Marvel. He was very good at nurturing uh, younger talent. And I guess I was younger back then. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> no. But Carl would, you know, he he was very helpful. I, some of it was mysterious. He, I remember once he said, "You've got to tighten up and loosen up." And I, that was like a Zen koan, you know. And I'm like, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> wow, well, like, there is meaning there. You know? Yeah. You have the skills. You have to tighten up your craft so that when you're working, especially inking, you can't ink carefully. You have to ink with confidence you know uh, precision is fine but then it looks like you were drawing that way okay. and if you want to be lively and, and spontaneous or have life to it you have to draw it that way and so being overly careful is not the best way to ink and i think that was his way of encouraging right. to work on the skills yeah. practice 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 but then when you're doing the work just let it go yeah yeah and uh, mm. yeah hell no you're um you're, you're, I think you're a couple of years older than me, actually, and um, I'm always interested with people in a in the career, especially when they've been in a long career. Do you think you're at your peak of your skills now, or do you think you peaked in your fifties or forties or thirties? Well, there was this one weekend where I peaked. Oh no, you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm talking um, about the. I'm talking about the art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I think I'm better in many ways. I'm better at doing what I want to do now just because I, I don't have to think about it. Like where I was just talking about, you practice and you do it and eventually you're just doing it. I mean, this, yeah. this the latest job I just did for um, this Weird Al anthology, uh, the, uh, collecting uh, Weird Al, uh, sort of like yeah. a, a version of rock videos where we're illustrating the song lyric. At the last minute, um, I was going to be doing this thing in October, and the editor said, "Oh, uh, actually, it's due at the beginning of, you know, it's beginning at the end of September, not the end of October." So all of a sudden, I had no time to do it, and um, he ended up stealing me a couple of weeks. But earlier on in my career, if I had to turn around a story from start to finish in a couple of weeks, it might have been a real problem. And I, I wasn't looking forward to it. It was it was a pain in the butt. But I actually got ahead of steam going, and I really liked yeah. the way it turned out. Uh, I, I don't know that I would have done it as well when I was younger. Not and I, don't, I think part of the thing is when you're younger, even though I love some of my early work and I drew differently, I look back at work from 20, 30 years ago, and I go, how did I draw that? How did I draw that way? Because my style has evolved. Um, sure. But I think what I learned to do is strip out affectations and just go for the the pure, gutsier, whatever it is. Simplify yeah. it, you know, uh, sort of, I don't know what, uh, go the to the essence. Of yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's the, what I'm trying to do, you know. And, and and I'm better able to see when I'm close to that, heading in the right yeah. direction. When you're younger, Oh, I want to draw 500 uh, characters running over a hill. You don't realize, well, you don't see any of them if you draw all of them, you know. So uh, it's just, yeah, it's a process of maturing, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And it's also experience, isn't it? Because you've seen it, you've done it, you know, you've been there before to a certain extent. So that experience, I would imagine, yeah. helps as it does with any profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and sort of part of the uh, part of the catch there is that. The longer you draw, the more you can, your style can become like a crutch where you're not actually uh, hands anymore or thinking about it in a new way. You're just drawing the hand you drew a thousand times. Yeah. That's a sword. It's great to have a style, 
but then what, at one point your style might become a dead thing and and that does happen to people but uh you know i'm still on the up curve i just don't get any work because you know i'm sort of semi-retired not well i was not getting enough work and i said it's a lot better to call yourself semi-retired than underemployed <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking it on i'm owning it i'm making it mine so. and i'm having quite a right so. yeah that's why i so, call myself semi-celibate nowadays <laughs> so exactly. since you mentioned the weird out thing um i don't have it all up on my screen but we've got there I, are to show you. I don't know if this is going to work i'm going to put you on full screen if uh let's have a see if i can put you on the big right. screen so, uh, this, so we can that's see me. You <laughs> not too yeah, pretty I there i start oh. with the i start with the lyric obviously in this case i'm working on this guy oh. Uh, we're trying to get this guy dropping his pants because he's mooning a crowd. And then nice. that, is, that ends up as this pencil rough. These are, you know, like, like on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of. Uh, Have you got a way to move your light around? I think the lights really can't oh, see okay. anything. Right, the light might be, might be causing problems. Yeah, or is that too hot? That's, that's probably worse. That's too hot. <laughs> that's too hot. Too hot. <laughs> <laughs> this, may not, this may not be the best here. Well, I'll show you the art. This will. Oh, that's, that's that's that little bit more. Have you got an overhead light? That might help. That's the panel. The same guy dropping his trousers. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I love drawing aliens. This goes back to the Wally Wood and EC influence and stuff. Right. Uh, anyway, I, I've got really it. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Go Have ahead. You I can show more of that stuff, but you know what I've been doing on my own. Here's like a I have this book labeled sci-fi. So I was just showing you some yeah. science. This is the kind of stuff I do now. I just fill up these books with illustrations. I just draw them for my own amusement. Wow. And then all the originals are for sale, but um, there's just, you know, tons of, tons of things in here. Are these on your website, Hill? Yeah, some of them. I mean, some of them, I just have too many to put up there. So I, I do both a website where I, I, I have the artwork and then I... Um, like I have a Patreon page, and what I do is these drawings, I will do like the process. So I'll show, you know, from the rough drawing all the way through the finish yeah. of how to do this stuff. But you can see the Wally Wood and the influence in this stuff. I can, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. There are links down below in the description box. So anyone wants to check any of the there you know, you things out. Woo, which way? It's upside down. Anyway, lots of the same kind of things, spacemen and monsters. And I love that kind of pulpy stuff. Mm. I, you know, it's funny because I, as much as I love Plastic Man, he's my favorite character, superhero character. I don't really feel superheroes. Um, I know that's what ninety percent of Marvel DC do, but um, for me, my favorite comics were always the anthologies. So even back when Marvel and whatever they were uh, before they were Marvel and DC, they were doing superheroes in the forties. There would be other backup stories and other characters. Yeah, and I just I love yeah. the age you know format of getting in and out. Um, I'm not an epic guy. I really like telling short stories with a punchline. Uh, so I, th that's kind of my favorite thing. But superheroes, mm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't dream about superheroes. You know? I, <laughs> no. Have you got a favorite genre that you like? No, you like so working like sci-fi or horror or? Yeah. Humor, I like I to think of my own stuff as sort of um, sci-fi, uh, horror, noir, you know, cartoon noir, basically. So it's combining all of those things because I love them all equally. But generally, there's a sense of to it. Things are a little bit rubbery or you know, wacky, wackadoodle. Um, put Carl on full screen to have a look at those. That's oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Creepy yeah. Princess Club. That's, that's when I was like watching the, uh, the the Patreon page. I think I. Uh, uh, I figure we've been shooting a cock and bull more than an hour. And we haven't even hyped you yet. I was like, I was trying to get around to saying, "Hey, there's links about the Weird Al thing." So down the, below. All down below, and there's all these things, and this is how you can get to him. But we've just been shooting the shit so long and having fun. Mm. Took an hour to get to hype you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's all right. You don't Buy his artwork. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's become a patron. What, what's the, yeah. What's the um, benefits on your Patreon? What 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 extras can people get if they sign up? 
Well, actually, you know, it's funny because um, I don't do that anymore. When I first started, I was like everybody else. Uh, you know, you have tears and all that. Yeah. And they then they wrote me and said, well, we're going to start charging them taxes because I guess the government was cracking down saying, if you are giving something you're getting, that's, that's an exchange. Therefore, it's a sale and they have to pay taxes. And I thought, these are people that are, you know, the whole idea of Patreon is to be a patron to artists, to help them, to yeah. contribute, you know. And I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not comfortable sort of trying to wheedle money out of people. So I said, it's totally free. You know, there's no paywall. If you want to become a member or become a patron and join at a certain level, that's great. And I encourage it. I appreciate it. But you don't. You can want. You can read it for free if you don't have the money. So, um, so the benefits really are what everyone gets the same benefits. So, you know, I started out like I said, I give a sketch away or that sort of thing, and then and I gave free sketch to my patrons at, at some point, and then I just said, no, nah, I'm going to do away with that. I'm putting the art up there. I'm going to show how I do my work, and I like to think of it like a little bit of an art school. I'm showing how I draw anyway. So that you know. I thought younger artists might appreciate seeing step by step, uh, st you know, stage from pencil rough all the way to finish things. So. Right. If you like the art, the links down below to go and buy some, Noreen. Look at, <laughs> Look at this. How can you not love this? I mean, here. <laughs> uh, have you ever done anything on YouTube, like artist streams, like drawing streams or anything like that? Is that something you thought we'll maybe do at some point? I, I don't actually do YouTube. I have to buy one of those cameras to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a full screen. I, a stark and moody, isn't it? That looks like Frankenstein's laboratory. I think this one I put up there and I asked people to write a caption for it. Like, you know, what is she saying to the alien in this one? Yeah, but I see a bed there and a, a vase now. I know it's, no, it's, it's, I'm getting more uh, the picture now. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, I'm not holding it steady enough. Anyway, no, it's, 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 I think it's the light. The light kind of like makes it hard to sort of. I, I uh, need to. Uh, next time, if next time we do this, I'll figure out a way to get my images up on the screen and stuff. I, I wasn't prepared for that. So. Yeah, and it's, yeah. If you come on again, you can send us some images, and I can share them from from here, kind of thing. Just have them pop up on the screen. There you go. Yeah. we should have done that. Yeah. Make no yeah. mistake, you have a standing invitation. Anytime you want to come on. You want to kvetch about stuff? We don't have to talk comics. I told you, my question, not even comic related. Not even a little bit. <laughs> How the hell do you say Paxi? Is it Poxy? Is it Paxi? I want well, one. <laughs> I, was referring, I was referring to the Polish pastry. Oh. That is it's part of the, you know, uh, the pre-Lent, you know, uh, party that goes on right before, you know, right before everybody. Uh, has to fast. And it's called punch key. Punch I see key. I'm not even close. You pronounce punch it punch key. key, but it's spelled P what P A C Z S K I or something. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's punch key, but it's basically a it's like a, a cream or or fruit filled donut essentially. That's all it is. Punch key, so he's got it. That sounds like something you open a hotel door with. You got the punch key. But yeah, it's P A C Z S K S K I or something like that. It's so is it Polish? Something is wrong with the tomatoes in the garden. Is that is that a euphemism? That's the that's the uh, I'm guessing that's his uh, caption for your uh, picture you showed earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that the tomatoes in the garden some sort of uh, UK euphemism? Uh, uh, not as far as I'm aware. No, he's not from the UK anyway, nor in Red, I don't believe. But uh... okay. well, one red is from wherever, whatever planet with Chala Bob. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Super we got people planet. from all over the world on here. Katie's <laughs> up in Detroit. Kenneth's on. I haven't seen Las Cruces yet, but he'll pop up from New Mexico. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I want to talk to you about. See, I then forgot how to pronounce it. I'm gonna say Paxi again because I didn't. <laughs> we, we, we just have pancakes here. We have pancakes. But, it's easier to say. Um, but that you know, you, I'd love to pick your brain at any point in time. Right over your shoulder, there's old Hollywood. He's just a genius with old Hollywood and the black and whites, and you know, oh, right, culture with that. You're there you go. Fan, yeah? 
talking about the, the movie poster up on the wall. Right? Yeah. Now that actually a British film. Oh, uh, Diane Doors is that? Diane Doors. Yep. Diane Doors. Okay, that's old school. Yep. And, she was uh, our Marilyn Monroe, I believe. I yes. Was, yes, she was the British Marilyn Monroe. What, what did they call her? The whatever from Swinton? I forget what they called her. They had some. Oh, Siren. yes. I don't know. I don't know. Siren from Swinton, maybe. She, she uh, well, I was sitting at uh, the very first, I think it was the very first C2E2 in Chicago. Not terribly well attended. It was their first show. And I'm sitting in Ernest Alley, and across the way is a dealer selling movie posters. And I was looking at this thing for like three days. And finally, on the last day, I said, oh, what the, how much are you selling this thing for? <laughs> Because I never really bought a vintage poster before, and I, you know, so I, I on the last day they gave me a deal. So. Okay. <laughs> what film? What film is that? What film it is, is it for? Uh, Blonde Sinner, the man oh. and story of a lost soul. Uh, I I only ever saw Diana Doors like in her later years when she was like bumped off in horror movies, like a horror anthology movie. That's the only oh, time I've ever seen her. She she was she was in a infamous. Um, episode of Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, I don't know if you can read any of that copy on the thing. Anyway, she was in this uh, infamous episode that was banned. Uh, it was first, it was pulled from, from TV and now you can watch it on YouTube. But she's a, a magician's assistant and they do the saw act where, you know, where he cuts her in half on stage. So you, you could look that up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then she's a little past her prime, you know. Yeah. Uh, like yeah, she went a bit chubby. She went she chubby in her old. Plump, let's say. Yeah, but yeah. she cuddly. She wasn't from you know, wasn't the Diana Doors of the early fifties or the nineteen forties, uh, mm. where she was kind of cherubic. You know, I mean, yeah. hell, she was like uh, David Lean, you know, filmer too. Anytime we can yeah. talk about comic books and the likes of Charlie Chaplin, I'm in all day long. So. Is it is it a larger lady called Rubenesque? Is that not a, the applied? Yeah, Rubenesque. Yes, yeah, she was Kate Rubenesque. Rubenesque. That I don't think she, wasn't she in um wasn't she in that Vincent Price film where he's uh, murdering all these guys? Yes, the State Theatre of Blood. That one where was it Theatre yes. of Blood where and he's she, like Shakespeare and Exeter. I forget how. I, uh, I think she was. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think, she's, but I think he's, she's one of the victims, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, he's that just, was one of my goals. We went from comics to theater of blood. That, that film, that, that film terrified me and my brother as kids because it said on the, it said in the write up on the TV Times comedy horror. So we was only about eight or something like that. We're like, oh, let's stay up and watch this. This is gonna and like heads on on blinking uh, milk bottles. Oh yeah, he force fed his own dogs. It was like well, yeah, oh, right, oh, right. Look. <laughs> they, they put a, they make a pie with poodles. Yeah, with his two poodles and then stuff them down throat till he chokes to death. And we were watching again. I don't know if I want to watch this anymore. And it's like no, we got to watch it to the end now. But we were traumatized by that one for a while. I tell you. You know, it's funny because um, I have very little tolerance. Certainly did in, when I was younger. I grew up with a black and white television set at home, so I wasn't going out to see a lot of color movies. So gore and violence was terrifying to me on the screen. It was very hard for me to sort of understand that it wasn't happening in real life, but it had a, it had a real visceral effect on me. <clears throat> but I've always enjoyed horror comics because somehow that tongue-in-cheek grisly humor works better when it's drawn. But, you know, like when it's, when it's actually, there are actors involved and, and stage blood, whatever, and it's reenact. It, it's like a reenactment of a murder. It's no longer a story, right? It's like, why do we have to see this thing? I don't, I, I yeah. So I'm, I'm not the best audience for film or necessarily, unless it's the old fashioned kind. Yeah. Where, they, where, where, you know, the shadows are cast on the wall, that kind of thing. Did you like the Hammer, mo Hammer movies? Yeah. I and mean, then before that, the Universal Horror, or better mm. yet, the Val Luton films from the 1940s, like Cat People, I Walk with a Zombie. Um, the seventh victim. Those are some of my favorite. Horrors. Yeah, well, I think I've seen them maybe one or two of them years ago, kind of thing. Even the Hammer Horrors, I've seen Hammers for ages, but as a kid, it's like Hammer Horrors were. It was, it was scary then. When you watch them now, and they're like, I can't believe I was scared by this. Well, but see, they what they did, what like the Universal did the stuff in black and white. So then they take, um, you know, Bella Lugosi and and they have Chris. Lee and real red, bright, vivid red blood—not not red like blood, but 
red like you would imagine blood would be in in, in a movie. And yeah. they were adding an element of gore, not to mention, you know, bosoms that hadn't been seen in those films before. N not just any old bosoms, but heaving bosoms, the best kind. Heaving bosoms, yes. <laughs> my, my, my scariest moment, it still remains my scariest moment watching horror films. I was I was about thirteen or fourteen, um, and I was I was babysitting for my younger sister who was three or four, and we had an old black and white we we had a black and white television. My parents had gone out somewhere. I was babysitting, and I was sitting on the floor, I was watching the television, and it, the day of the Triffids was on, <laughs> and I wasn't usually allowed to watch this sort of horror type film. And if yeah. you remember the day of the Triffids, the, the, the plants have these long sort of tendrils that come out and go yeah. like that. Anyway, I oh, sat yeah. there in the dark with just the black and white television on, aged about 13. And I'm sat there watching these tendrils go like this. And suddenly <laughs> this thing comes out of the dark and hits my hits my face like this, this wet sort of tendril thing. <laughs> and I'll leap up in the air. It's my dog. Has come and licked my face. <laughs> oh, I mean, your dog's tendril? I, I hope mean, it was. <laughs> it was the perfect way. Forget, forget Jaws or any of these other moments. <laughs> Never again. That's it. That's it for me for horror films. That was my scariest moment ever. Oh, imagine, wow. it, I just, imagine if I William Castle about... had come up with that as one of his gimmicks in his movies where he could have a dog going. Yeah. <laughs> Licking people right when the giant leaped or whatever. Could have trained them, <laughs> trained a lot of dogs. He was the one of the tingler, the vibrating chairs and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I got a similar story, like from watching. We're well, not really watching horror films. As a kid, me and my brother were watching one of the old TVs. You had to push the buttons to turn the channels over, and it was late at night. And you only had three channels in the in the UK at that time. And he's going like that. One and going through them all quickly because they're so boring. And like you happen to turn on the hammer horror just as Christopher Lee was right up to the camera, big face screen again. <sighs> that is most terrifying. And my brother literally leapt across the, the room, like like away from the turned it over and leapt across the room away from it. And like it was like, oh, what was, what was going on? We, we, we put it back on after about a few minutes because you're like, you know, you, you turn it over. No, you turn it over. I don't want it. But we watched it in the end, but yeah. yeah. That was he jumped so out of his skin, literally. Well, not literally, obviously, but you know, uh, as good as. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. What about uh, writing? You, you write you writing your own comics? Done a lot of that, or? Well, usually what I've done, I mean, when I first started, I have. I have written some mm. comics, but um, typically I would write in collaboration with people, and maybe it's just a certain lack of uh, confidence, but. Um, one of the first things I wrote at Marvel was uh, the first uh, pu Punisher, the first issue of What the. Um, I, had, I had, as an inker, I'd, I'd inked a few Punisher covers, and I remember I was inking one of them. I was like, man, I just don't like this character. This isn't the Marvel characters I grew up with. He's just shooting you know, people, and and so I, I told Carl, Carl Pop was the editor. I said. You know, Carl, I really don't want to ink this character anymore. Don't offer me any Punisher stuff. But I'd love to do a pair of them. And they were doing what? And so I had I had an idea for the story. But I gave the plot to my friend Peter Gillis, uh, who wrote a great script. And that's in the very first uh, issue of what? And after that, I, I wrote a few stories with my friend Doug Rice. Uh, uh, we did so, sort of follow-ups to that story. And we wrote a number of things. And I... I had a hand in the plotting of Plastic Man, if not the scripting. Um, you know, um, what else have I written? I don't know. I mean, you know, when you're doing a story like I just did this, uh, uh, the, the the Weird Al story, you're not you're not you're not the writer. I mean, there's a there's a text. It's the song lyrics, and that text in the comic is the lyrics. That's that's all I had to work with. But you have to write the gags because, you know, I, the song I illustrated was called uh, Dare to be Stupid, which is a it wasn't a parody of a specific song, but it was in the style of the band Devo. Remember those guys, you know, are we not men? We are Devo. Whip it was their big hit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dare to be stupid is brilliant. So so, you know, so it's a fun song, but there's a video that we're 
did back in the day. And I, I watch it and I go, well, I have to come up with different gags. So I'm not the writer, but you end up writing those gags. You know, you end up, anytime you're drawing a story, you have to, even if you're not writing it, you're the actor, you're sort of the director and the cinematographer and all of that stuff. You have to imagine what it's going to look like. But how something plays is writing. It's, you know, it's, it's not literal text, but it's, it's, it's part of the text. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that properly, but no, I write, I write stuff, but most of the stuff I write is silly and humorous, and there isn't that much work of that out there, you know. No. So, I was glad to see that you got Dare to Be Stupid, even though I'm, uh, I wish you would have got Christmas at Ground Zero. I think you would have had so much fun with that. Is that in the book? Did someone else illustrate that one? Um, I haven't gotten to it yet, but um, when I saw that you were doing Dare to Be Stupid, I thought how appropriate. But his song Christmas at Ground Zero, I can just I can envision you doing the comic book. It, it literally is something like out of Garbage Pail Kids and the Adam Bum Kid. And, you know, it's the name of the title of the song says it all. It's Christmas at Ground Zero. Perfect. And he makes this little poppy tune about, you know, jumping under the tables and school at schools and things. And he all alerts with that. And I thought, Don't oh, that. Gil would be so funny drawn to, with that to the sight gags with that. But then dare to be stupid. I thought, well, that's that bit you perfect. Well, they, they what they Tell did is people they, talk they, about they, this stuff. They sent me a list of titles. So I would go and then find them on YouTube and watch the videos. Yeah. Be stupid. That was the one that jumped out to me of the ones. Yeah. That, that, that particular wasn't in there. If someone else, yeah. after I said, I'm doing Dare to be Stupid, they said, Oh, you would have been great for it. And it, it was something like the attack of the bee monsters. It was something like yeah. the 50s science fiction, uh, bad science fiction movie kind of thing. I never even heard of that one, but it certainly wasn't offered to me. So. Just the whole concept with like drawing songs and things like that, parody songs. There are so many of those that like you immediately come to mind when those come up, you know, that immediately. Who is a contemporary artist who could do that? You. You. you know, <laughs> so. I've done this once before, many years ago. Kitchen Sink, you know, Dennis Kitchen did Grateful Dead comics, which was essentially yeah. the same thing, but with Grateful Dead lyrics. And I suppose the Grateful Dead do some funny stuff, but they don't do, they don't do humor like weird ass. <laughs> and <laughs> so the story, I, I illustrated a story and I totally, they said, you can do whatever you want. And I made it very dark. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't think it was a big hit with anybody because it was uh, maybe not in the spirit of the Grateful Dead. I don't know. I only got one. They, they forwarded me a letter of comment. He says, I can't believe you took one of their funkiest songs and made it such a downer. You know, that was, <laughs> that was my fan mail. Oops. <laughs> oh, dear. I was, yeah. Have you got like a, not not your favorite character, but your favorite piece of work, like a, a, either a panel or a, a comic book, where you look back at it and go, that was really, it like, makes you laugh. You'll look at it to this day, kind of thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I there, you know, when I'm drawing characters and doing these sketches, you know, it's like there's a certain rhythm to a figure, and I know, and and I know when it's right and I know when it's wrong. You know, it's like you just keep moving the fingers, or the arms, or the legs, and and then you finally get the right balance or the right gesture, and somehow that's funny or that's that's got the right weight to it, whatever it is. There's these certain things that I can't even explain, but I just like the drawing. Some of my favorite drawings, you know, no one's ever seen. Them drawings i do for myself and i mean i put them up for sale yeah but it, it, it just it's like to me it's like when it just captures something and the drawing is uh is just right and like to me i'm I think i'm always trying to capture an ink line out of 1955 or something i'm always looking for that perfect brush stroke and and you know if you're working somewhat spontaneously it's hit or miss sometimes you're going to get it sometimes you're not. So every once in a while something comes together and I'm like, oh, that's great. I like that. <laughs> but usually it's a mix of get or done, you know, with trying to make it perfect somewhere. Like as I like to say, I'm a perfect, I'm an imperfect perfectionist. So I'm always fucking miserable. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Like, because you're never really happy. Nothing's ever good enough. But you're always trying to put that and just be out of reach. You know? Is that where the Surly Hack comes yeah. from? Well, I, you know, Surly Hack literally came from when I when I did Stupid, which is at Image Comics. When those guys broke off and did Image, you know, Mark Silvestri had Top Cow and Rob Liefeld had Extreme Studios. Jim Lee had his studio. And, and and when I was doing my comment for them, like I got to come up with a stupid name for a for a studio, so I said Surly Hack, and it kind of plays into me being kind of crouchy a little bit, but it's also like a cautionary thing. Like you do you don't want to become that. Like so the last thing I want to be is a hack or a miserable grouchy hack. So. Or a curmudgeon. Yeah, for people to tell yeah, me. Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Gray man has already failed at least three of those. What? What? <laughs> Gray the crusty curmudgeon. So I'm not talking about first my personality or when I said, "Oh, this is what I don't want to be," and I just grew into it. You know. <laughs> yeah, it happens. <laughs> it happens, yeah. It's like people don't want to turn into their own fathers, that kind of thing. And then you find you find you look exactly like them or something, and wearing the same clothing. It's like no. You know, you know working in comics too. And we we're talking about how you're, you know, you're a freelancer. You're never, you're always, you're always looking for your next job. You're always waiting for work. Uh, you know, I never took vacations when I was young because, you know, I would go to a convention. And there's not much of a convention, uh, a vacation if you're looking for work at a convention. Yeah. But, you know, there's always time between work and, I mean, maybe some guys are always employed, but most people have downtime and it's hard to justify taking a vacation when you're not working, you know, half the week. So, um, but you, you can get kind of burnt out. And, and for me, periodically, like when I was, I had to get out of inking because I just burnt out. It was, just wasn't, thank you, Roger, Ranger, excuse me, Ranger. Thank you, Ranger. Ranger I don't, fly, yeah. I got to put yeah. my... My glasses on my specs. <laughs> it wasn't what you mean earlier on. <laughs> so anyway, you know, like like I had to get. That's when I had to get into writing and drawing because I knew I would just be burnt out, and I just forgot why I was why I was doing it. It was a job, and uh, and I, you know, and so I periodically I have to rekindle that fun that 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 whatever it is that got me into it in the first place, mm. so I don't become the surly hack. <laughs> yeah. yeah so so what we need to do hill is we need to get you across to the uk next year for uh, a convention we have in a place called harrogate called thought bubble and you know how you described your uh, chicago comic con back in the days where it was the artists and there were some professional ones but there were amateur ones and it was all about mingling with the creators we've yeah. got a great comic convention in the uk called thought bubble and it's exactly like that so you get last year um you know we had some big professional guys who had jay uh james tinian the fourth and uh ram v and um jock but you also have a whole load of um you know people just starting up producing their own little comics which they can do now with you know the patreon stuff and the um crowdfunding stuff and it yeah. really is a fantastic, and it's all about comics. You know, nobody's selling Funko Pops. Nobody's selling, you know, cosplay costumes. It, it literally is all about the creators. And there's very few, there's actually, they restrict the number of um, stores actually selling comics. So it's, 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 it's a huge, like, artist, uh, artists. Um, I, have um, heard of the show. I have heard of the show and I've heard nothing but good things. So I, I'd love to, I'd love to get there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a little chat with the organizers and see. Right. Campaign begins now. Yeah. Campaign, campaign begins, begins now because. Well, um, it's will really they pay his airfare though? Yeah. No, I think if you, if you're, me if you're invited, well, if you're I'll, I'll you're invited guest, you get your airfare paid. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking at John Bishop, who I know. Yeah. Um, he's come here to Chicago. Anyway, he's talking about out, people outside of comics. Well, you know, Kyle was talking about film and he held up Charlie Chaplin. I mean, when I was young, it was a debate, an internal debate anyway. Not, the world didn't care. But, you know, whether I do comics or whether I get into film, and I realized that I had absolutely no talent in film and also it required working with other people. And I was much better off on my own. So, so I gravitated towards comics. 
Plus, film was seemed to be happening somewhere else. It was happening in California. Anyway, so, but early on, you know, my favorite artists were guys like Master Keaton and Chaplin and, um, you know, <coughs> violent comics, but also the Marx Brothers and uh, comics of the uh, later eras. And I love those guys. And in terms of artists, I have too many favorite artists, but I fell in the love with the same artists that everybody else did. At one point, I loved Salvador Dali. I but illustrators, guys like Franklin Booth and Joseph Clement Cole and all those early illustrators that influenced Wrights and that he used in his Frankenstein period. Uh, Gary Gianni, artists like that are influenced by those guys, a sort of classic line work uh, from early American illustration. That stuff was a big you know, influence on me. And, and then in comics, you know, there's many more influences just because I've spent more time looking at that stuff. But I study old films and particularly I mentioned noir black and white films lit by the geniuses that came to Hollywood, most of them from, you know, Europe to escape. Yeah. War, just created the most dynamic uh, compositions and lighting schemes where they create depth and space. Metropolis. And to one. me, that's, I'm always trying to do that in a comic panel. You know, to me, there's two things you can do in comics. You can create movement, which is, you know, guys like Kirby are great at that and others. But then there's depth, and and people like like Wallace Wood would be the the number one champion for that. Just like each comic panel is like a little diorama you can walk into, you know, and you could just fall down, you know, a mountainside or, or you know climb over rocks and see a vista. That 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 is overlooked by a lot of the comic artists that they're going into the panel, and I love that uh, that that other d direction you can take things instead of just the movement, the lateral movement that you get action um and i got 90 percent of that comes from film or artists influenced by film guys like wood and others that would you know they would take either photographs and study the way the lighting actually worked on the model or they would just go right like will eisner did you, you could study films and will eisner was there in the 1930s they were doing the same thing into the 40s and he put that stuff right into the spirit okay i'm yeah. stopping I'm stop. this is where i stop the ramble here <laughs> no, really I could talk about film and comics, you know, really pretty much forever. So <laughs> some you guys can just call it a night, but no, no. I'm cool. You can talk as much as you like, mate. <laughs> I think Mark, right. Mark has to go drink some beer and have topics. I want to leave my dinner and leave you guys chatting. <laughs> <laughs> Got another question from Graphic Man. Does a good stream. Uh, I think you're going to like it tonight, Graphic Man stream, I believe. Um, have you ever turned down any jobs? Yeah, I mean, it, that would come down mostly to, you know, not interested because it's just not my thing to drawing that particular thing or the pay isn't good or you don't want to work with a certain publisher or editor or whatever. Uh, but, you want to hear them stories? You know, early on, I don't think I turned anything down. You know, you, you just don't do it. And uh, But, you know, it's pretty rare that I turn stuff down. I remember I was doing stuff for when Dark Horse did Creepy uh, comics. I did a couple stories, and the editor there is great, Sean Agor. But she offered me a, a third story, and it was just so grim. I totally got the politics of the story. I won't go into the details. But I just didn't want to spend weeks drawing the horrible things that were going on in that story. And, uh, and so I said, you know, this is a great story, but it's for somebody else. I need I need more humor in what I do. Yeah. So, yeah, every once in a while, there's something like that where it just doesn't quite work. Um, mm. And if you ever talk to my, my uh, co-writer, Doug Rice, who I, I've done any number of projects with Doug, you know, uh, the two of us writing a story is, is often a bit of a um, slugfest for the first few sessions because we're – we have different w ideas of what we want to do with something, or it's one of the guys is into you know something and a particular slant or a joke, and the other person isn't. Uh, you know, finding uh, finding your, the, what you want to do and how you want to do it is half of the thing when I'm working on a project. So if you can if you can see the the train wreck coming, you just say no, thank you. You know, that's the best thing. Getting into the train wreck. And then trying to have to figure out how to crash the train without killing yourself. That's no fun. At all. That's no fun at all. Did that answer your question? I don't even remember what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you didn't work for someone. 
Someone else can give There's certain people I will never work with. You know, you talked about critiques. Like I would never ever work with Jim Shooter on anything because no. I just I didn't like the way he ran Marvel when he towards the end of his uh, tenure there. But he, he was just making artists and everybody redraw things. He was rewriting scripts. It was it was just overbearing editorial, you know, uh, ego. And I, I'm, I'm only picking him as an example because it's been publicized. It's not like it's a secret and everything. But it just, you know, I like to be creative and I like people that hire you to do what you do and not to be micromanaged or told what to do to the nth degree. Um, and I think you get the best stuff out of people when you let them do what they do best. It's just Absolutely. actually, you know, I, I understand why they're editors and there are ways that com companies want to direct their product line and all that crap. But that's not who I am. I'm not, that's not my job. My job is a creator. And as a creator, I work better when people let me go. It just, you know, I mean, uh, you know, like the, the Weird Al thing was great. Nobody, nobody had me redraw anything. The editor would say, looks great, you know, when I'd send in a page. And like, that's what you want to hear, you know. Beautiful. Have you ever done Swamp Thing? Noah says he's so you sort of. I love Swamp Thing, and I have got sketches of him here. I could probably find ah. him. I've got I've got my monster books here of my sketches, and I'll bet if I flip this open for a couple of seconds, I'd find Swamp Things in here. Lots of Frankenstein monsters and lots of Swamp Things. Okay. Have you got a favorite monster? Professionally, I've never drawn them professionally. Here, here's a Swamp Thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, nice. Nice, he looks, nice. He looks suitably brutish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, re I really, you know, I, I, Alan Moore wrote he lo that thing looks, that looks a bit like Swamp Thing if Karloff played him. Swamp Thing's what? If Karloff had been something. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think <laughs> I think the Karloff makeup has influenced my work. You know, <laughs> various roles, let me say. Yeah, it's cool. Does that look like Karloff? I, mean, I, I thought you did, but a little bit I saw. Let's put you on the big screen again. Oh, I love that. That's really good. Something about his face. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, it is see. a bit Carl, Boris Karloff. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I uh, and then if I if I showed you this this the um, all of the uh, Frankenstein monsters I do, there's a lot of Karloff in there too. Yeah. I think there's Karloff in this one, even though it's really goofy. Let me see. <laughs> Hold on. That looks like Bill from Comic Max Musings. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does yeah. But there's a little <laughs> tunnel up in there, too. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Made this like lecture on Lush Inking style. Well, you know, I, I really do think uh, if, somebody, if somebody was penciling the way I ink, and very few pencilers do anymore, uh, you know, where you're doing shadows and all of that rendering, um, yeah, those would be characters would be fun to ink or a horror book. Um, mm. You know, see most of the stuff. I mean, some of the technology has changed comics and computer color carries so much more weight now in terms of separating and doing the kind of depth stuff I was talking about. Very few people do it with shadows. Anymore. They're doing it now with computer color. And did uh, you ever ink Gene Colan? No. <laughs> I mean that would have been that would have been something. I don't know what I would have done with Gene Colan. I, I have a Tomb of Dracula original somewhere, and you know Tom Palmer. I don't think he got any better than Gene Colan than Tom Palmer. But there was so much interpretation because he would just pencil swooshes, you know, line work and gray. And how do you ink gray? Well, there is no gray in black and white. I mean, not 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 in a color comic anyway. Uh, yeah, no, I never got the ink Gene Colan, but I would have been intimidated. <laughs> so how just it was me just inquiring about sort of the lifestyle of a, a comic artist uh, do, have you always been able to work from home or have you have ever had to go into an office to do your work well i with me it was a matter of one choice i like in, in working at home so i've always worked at home yeah, uh, but also you, you you have to pay for a studio, so it's an extra expense. And my, my friends who who enjoy working with their friends, they do that. They'll they'll rent a part of a group space. And I was just yeah. reporting, there's a studio there, um, Helioscope Studios that has maybe twenty years to thirty artists at, at, at its peak. Right. Um, yeah. I, I I have a hard time concentrating enough at home. 
uh, you know, <laughs> in the studio where everybody was doing their own thing. I'd just be walking around talking to people. I, I, I remember um, early on when I was inking at Marvel, um, Carl Potts, my editor, uh, called me up and said, hey, there's another guy in town there, and uh, he doesn't know anybody in comics. And, um, you know, would, would you know, would you, you know, would you mind talking to him or whatever? And yeah. That guy was Mark Sylvester, and he was, at the time, he might have been doing King Conan or maybe a spider project, I'm not sure. But uh, I ended up talking to Mark, and I had lost a roommate in my apartment. And Mark said, look, I want to get out of my apartment and work somewhere else. And so he ended up working in my living room for, for some number of months before he left town. Okay. And, and I got that's how we got to be friends way back when. And probably why I did a book at Image was because I was friends with Mark. Yeah. But uh, when Mark was working in my apartment, most of the time I would just sit there and watch him draw. You know, <laughs> I didn't have work right right at that time. And it was I was between stuff, and it was you know, a low point in terms of employment. And I was trying to get, <clears throat> I was trying to get working King Mark's so and some stuff that he had drawn. Mark Silvestri is great. I I, I agree. He's really really uh, my favorite of the uh, Image artists personally. Um, I happen to like uh, Eric Larson's stuff because he was the only serious guy to really do comics there and kept, you know, he's committed to Samuel Dragon like nobody committed to their book. Uh, yeah, I always thought that, that about He always seemed to have a real love for his characters and real love for Well, what general, about Sam Keith? Sam Keith. Oh, I, 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 all the artists have, you, you can talk about all the different guys. I'm just talking about favorites here, you know. Mm -hmm. Mark, yeah. Mark to me at his best had like, um, he sort of approached the kind of John Buscema kind of weight and 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 grace to his figures that you know the beautiful women and all that stuff. And some of the artists were just a little weirder, you know. I mean, Jim Lee draws like a mother, but it's way too tight for me personally. I know why he successfully deserves it, but it's, it's not my thing. I like the looser style. And now is drawing stuff with. Uh, uh, we were talking about illustration and. Uh, influence of illustrators. Mark is putting more line work. Once upon a time it was black and white when he was doing X-Men and Wolverine. And now he's doing more of the line work stuff uh, yeah. with, with his color. But he but he knows what he's doing. Does it. it's, it's really, you know, it's really great stuff. Um, but so, yeah, Sam Keith is uh, like really wild cartooniness and yeah. uh, writes in Frazetta, whatever, uh, inking style. And, yeah. It's an interesting mix uh, going on in Sam's work. Yeah. Plus, one of the weirder comics that they did, that's for sure. Very weird. And he's still doing it. Is he? Still does, he still does the max. He still does the max? Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. And the closest yeah. I can join the right max, next to me. I think I did the max on the back cover or, or somewhere. I did that. Maybe. Did I do it on the max? Anyway, no, no, maybe. No, I don't think I ever did. Sorry. Spit. You did. <laughs> so okay, that the, at the max. Okay, well then I drew the max. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was that was a pit parody, but it looks it's spit. Yeah. Oh, it's spit. Pit. It's spit. Yeah. It's spit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's Dale Keown. Sorry. Different yeah. Name. So, Hillary, here's one that I don't know if you've seen my videos on this, but you were talking about getting FedEx papers and stuff. Here's something that'll tickle you. Wait a minute, I gotta get my glasses on. Sheldon Mayer. <laughs> Where did you get it? Infantino to Sheldon Mayer, special delivery. You were sending him some sugar and spike. What was going on there? <laughs> oh no, it was even better. <laughs> oh, he the was the basis for all this. Your buddy here has all the pencil roughs to the entire book. Oh, okay. So there's letters from him. There's I've got all the pencil roughs. So Mayer did all of the Bible roughs. Okay. Yeah, he did all the roughs, even though he didn't do the finish art. And then another fun tidbit of uh, historical stuff that I got here are the. Uh, Where the hell did you get those from, Kyle? In-house photo stats that have uh, Carmine's notes on them. Okay. So, a little bit of history from the mid '70s. So he, he broke into the DC warehouse and went for the uh, the archives. 
Yeah, I think he was there <laughs> on a security. He was there on a security job and some stuff went I missing. was seven years old when this was put together. So. <laughs> Speaking of the Bible, I heard I heard that uh, Robert Crumb, who just drew like the Old Testament uh, a while back, did he? All of the original artwork for somebody for some like a couple million bucks. I don't know if it was George Lucas or whoever, but somebody bought it. Did he? Did he deal with the female characters in big butts? Well, I, well, you have you. It's, you can take a look and see see Crumb's Bible. Yeah. Uh, it was very, it was very faithful. It wasn't like he was just having characters humping each other. It was you know, <laughs> didn't even a Robert Crumb comic. He just he illustrated the Bible. Yeah. It was a lot of humping in the Bible, though, in the Old Testament. Oh, there was yeah. a lot of begatting anyway. There was a lot yeah, of begatting. Yeah. Yeah, begatting. Yeah, begatting. <laughs> but then, you know, who was it? Um, Moses gave his, his sister wife to one of the kings to, to just con him out some, some goods and chattels and stuff. I don't know. All sorts well, going on. If it's in the Old Testament, it'll be in that book. Uh, you'll have to take a look at it. It's funny. It must be a big book there. I, don't know, I suppose I can't be the whole thing. Um, well, you know, EC, EC did picture stories in the Bible. Uh, you know, the Bible's been done in comics for a long time. Of course, religious track comics like Jack Kick comics. Are, yeah. I was just in Portland, and I, I found one laying on the sidewalk, a Jack a Chick comic. Uh, I hadn't I seen those in years. Get- the Dungeons and Dragons one. Is it Dark Dungeons? The Tick Track? They someone made it into a movie. It's hilarious. Speaking of picture stories from the Bible, the fellow that I got that off of also has an envelope from and some pencil roughs to one of those originally see things in the late forties with that too. Yeah. So, nice little bits of history. A lot of things that just get thrown away because it's, you know, we got it, we got what we needed and just throw it away. We got lucky some of this didn't get thrown away. And mm, she got a group true. of historian friends and it's our job to figure it out. Like what I traded to get that yeah. was I had a printing plate to Sparkler Comics 19 from 1942. I had the back page of the Tarzan story, which is a Bern Hogarth art, and the printing plate was done by a master etcher, so it was just a work of art. Yeah. And I traded that for that, so I traded Golden Age for something more modern, and that's only been through the hands of four people. It went from Mayor to the person that got it to my friend in Montreal to me. In 50 years, that's been in four houses. So, and in the plate I traded, it's I traded it went to the third hand that's ever been in. So, cool. all that it's, history and stuff. But I was going to say to ask Hillary again about you know um, you're just doing this um, weird a Yankovic book. What's what's next? What's coming up? What happens with work? Do people approach you, or do you go and say, "Hey, you got any jobs for me?" To people, or how how does work well, come about? I'm not schmoozing anybody. That, yeah, that's part of the semi-retirement. Is I just you know I, I don't I'm not going to shows. I'm not going to New York, and uh, I don't really care. So if there's work and people find me, that's one. But you know, every once in a while, I, I I don't know who who got me this job, whether it was the editor or Al. But you know, when the, someone sends you an email and says, "Weird Al wants me to do this," I don't know if they're being literal or not. You know, um, so uh, but um, I'm just drawing for myself mostly. I have a number of projects that are somewhere in the middle, you know, drawn or written or whatever, and I, I'm not sure which one I'll. Perfect time frame with Weird Al. Well, in fact, that is why the comic exists. Absolutely. I have a feeling they, they wanted a comic to go with the movie. And it, 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 I think they call that Sears or something. But um, you know, somebody's a genius there. But it looks to be like, a place, Weird Al. <laughs> it looks to be a nice lineup of people. So. But, you know, that's just a one off thing for me. You know, If they do a second Weird Al, maybe I'll try to do the story that Kyle was talking about. <laughs> Was there any kind of like now you've got like when really a bit more free time? Is there any got like, any concepts or any of your own characters that you want to sort of maybe make a, your own self-published comic or something like that? Is that something that's ever appealed to you? Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I said. I, I've got several things. I've got a, like a couple of strips that I've drawn and uh, other things that are that are more character designs and 
and stories, strips, strip kind of things, but actual strips. Uh, I have a thing that I was drawn and then the letter dropped the ball and I haven't gotten back to it. Things only got boggled up during COVID there for a couple of years. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I need, since I'm my own boss on this stuff, I, I give myself way too much free time and I, I just need to knuckle down. Because uh, I sort of have to pick and choose what I'm going to do now. I figure I don't have that many big projects left in me before I just want to sit on a beach somewhere. So. Mm. I need to get an editor to, to, to put you in place and make you knuckle down. Well, you know, like a job like the Weird Al thing is if the money is good and the project is fun, it's easier for me. I've spent a whole career being a freelancer. That's what I naturally do. Being my own boss, you know, I'm not good at it. I'm just way too busy. Stuff. So, um, yeah, I need, I, need to, I need to, maybe I need to hire myself to be a boss. <laughs> is that possible? Yeah, Kyle. <laughs> I'm I'm it, Kyle. <laughs> now, but ironically, minutes. after this week, the show's bumping back an hour when people's schedules can get back to normal. So, ironically, after this week, we are an hour later. So, uh, yeah, you need somebody to prod you to do stuff. I told you, you got to stand an invitation if you want to be the talk, one of the talking heads on here. And not even be the centerpiece, you know. You want to talk to JM when we do JMD Mateus. I get Neil Gaiman on here, and you want to pick his brain. Come on, be no, one of us old parts. Say hi to those guys. You can say hi. I mean, I I worked on as an inker. I worked on uh, JM stuff, but uh, I did draw a story with Neil, uh, uh, a uh, a tribute to John Romita Jr. of all strange things. What? They, Marvel did like a 20th or 25th anniversary of JR JR's work at Marvel, and they wanted an original because mostly it was a reprint and a sort of a checklist kind of deal. And they asked Neil Gaiman to draw read the story, and I drew it. Don't ask me how that happened, but it did. Oh, wow. wow. Little that is story. strange. Yeah. Wow. Very strange. <laughs> JR was a character in the story. <laughs> yeah, go, 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 go find that one. <laughs> I'm going to try and find that one. It's, it's an odd little thing, but that's the only time I know what I want to do. Damn, now I need an autographed copy of that. I uh, hope you're ready for another batch of mail, because before you know it, I'm going to send you up a box like this and be like, hey, buddy, just sign these. <laughs> I don't mind signing comics. Oh, anyway, yeah. it's, it's for future shows. Just uh, we'll talk off offline, and uh, we'll figure that out. But yeah, guys, I mean, if, if you ever want to pop on, if you ever just want to, because we'll we'll have topics all over the place. You know, not just right. interviewing folks. We got segments and stuff. If you want to come on and talk segments and mm. creative ideologies, or uh, you know, I'm going to do a character study on eternity. Talk about a character I'd love to see you draw in a humorous light, kind of like with the old What the stuff. Probably, probably was in the What though, wasn't there? Was the the yeah. I, never, I never drew Eternity, but you asked me who my favorite character was. I said my favorite superhero. I don't really consider Doctor Strange a superhero, but you know that's what he is. I guess if he's in Marvel, Doctor Strange was the only character I ever really wanted to draw in Marvel that wasn't a humorous character. And I had to draw him in parodies. I done. I did a. Doug and I both did. Uh, he did the the Nick Fury story and uh, Shield story, and I did Doctor Strange. We did like a our version of Strange Things and what the. And it really was an opening of those years. Um, and um, I did a Doctor Strange thing at uh, Ongo. Asmo is kind of their Doctor Strange character. Chuck Dixon wrote a script where, you know, it really is Doctor Strange, and the, he, it's like the, the garage sale of Gilgamesh or whatever, and they find some some baster, this magical baster, turkey baster that is coveted magic. Anyway, so I've done a number of Doctor Strange-ish things, but I've never actually drawn Doctor Strange himself. Mm. But at this point, I don't want to do it. I mean, there's, you know. That'd be Brilliant, just to add him into the single doodle, single page doodles. But yeah. you know, I love your work. I love anything you get your inky fingers into. So, 
my favorite Doctor Strange is the very first one that did come true, where that guy is like waking up having the nightmare and the rainy night and smoking a cigarette and it's a yellow panel. I just love the film bar stuff that Ditko brought in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very heavily composed by uh, uh, Joe Orlando, uh, excuse me, uh, Joe Kubert, by the way. Um, his art style early on. All that shit. There you go. I'm just throwing names out now at random. There you go. <laughs> hey, I'll throw you know, right? names out. I know Hillary Barta, guys. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> How many yeah, cool how points did, how, I get right, so how Sorry, did you what was that meet, like? How did you t how did how did you meet Hill, Kyle? Oh, Just Kyle? like this. Kyle was stalking me on the internet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds all uh, right. Friends of, <laughs> I can believe friends, it. Of friends, Next friends question. of friends, a dialogue started in a thread, <laughs> poetry started being bounced around, jokes were bounced around. Oh. Just like I did with Gray, you know. Yeah, sounds Gray. Friends cross paths online. Jokes started flying. Then in comes Mark. It's all the same. How, I met, is how I met you guys, really. You're, you're sound with Dalek mode, Carl. Something's up uh, with your microphone. You sound like Dalek mode, mode again. <laughs> well, I, like, when, I, when I knew you were coming on, a stupid question, because I am a stupid person quite a lot. And uh, I was wondering, this. Uh, because your name, your, your surname Barter. I just wondered if you ever kicked anyone in the face and said, this is Barter or something like that. Ah, and then kicked him in the face like the, the Sparta film 300. I just had that picture in my head for some reason. Like maybe kick him into the swimming pool. This <laughs> is Barter. <laughs> kick him in the pool. When I was in what we called junior high school, we were studying the Spartans. And I became Barter yeah. from Sparta at that point. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a nickname for that that season, that term. But uh, right. yeah, so I... Yeah, I never. I am Bartikus. <laughs> Bartikus, that's a good one there. Eh? <laughs> no, I am Bartikus. Is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am Bartikus. You sound like oh, Bartikus. Bartikus? <laughs> yes, my mic's not bright anymore since this is like the last time I'm going to have this this phone yeah. thing. But you get a new phone. Yeah, I'm getting a new phone. I'm getting a new setup. This whole thing's you're, gonna. You're gonna get a new phone with better sound. Mark's gonna work out how to put his phone so it's in um, <laughs> landscape. landscape. But I will be back in the UK in two weeks' time, All right, so I can. Right. Yeah. All right, well, guys, we'll talk about that show. That that sounds like fun doing that word balloon show. Um, that would be great. Anyway, it's been fun. Cheers! Uh, thanks for coming on. Any last questions or are there? Uh, Oh, oh no, right. yes. Have you got any questions for us? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Embarrass me now. It's true the air. <laughs> well, uh, here's a question. How does the UK America thing work? Like, so in the UK, <laughs> you know, Marvel and DC are not UK companies, but they would do books. But are you guys more fans? Uh, did you grow up with 2000 AD or other or the UK books? Was that your first love? And then Marvel and DC or whatever, SpongeBob. Did that yeah. all later? Well, I always liked uh, the superhero TV shows. And I like the superhero comics, but I used to get like uh, the UK copies, but I haven't got any of them anymore. But I remember my dad used to buy me comic books from around the corner. It was always the British comics, like Cheeky Weekly, which is this show is kind of half named after, and the crazy gang, that kind of stuff, Wizard and Chips, and 2000 AD and um, Eagle. But I never got, I never told him to get me the American comics. I wish I had now, because those are the ones that I've like, liked into my into my adulthood kind of thing. I didn't actually start collecting properly comic, uh, American comics until I got my first job, because I never had the money before then. But I wish I'd said to me, Dad, get me some Batman comics instead of bothering with these humor comics that i was yeah i was getting at the time but never mind so with so so with me um we i i would uh so british comics we had a, a, a comic called the beano um yeah. which is the longest running comic in the world i think it started in 1937 it's weekly and it's on issue about 4200 so it is by far the longest running. Is it comic still going? Still, still going. going. It's a kids' comic. But it's not weekly anymore, though. Is Sorry? it monthly? Is it still weekly? I'm not sure it's weekly. I think it's still monthly, running. It's on issue about four thousand. Mm. Might be monthly now. 
Um, and uh, but <laughs> the, in my local town, there was a there was a there was a market stall, and at this market stall, you could buy secondhand American comics, Marvels and DCs, uh, Spider Man, Superman, uh, for the, very little money few pence so i used to spend my pocket money buying these american comics and i discovered um this was in in the north of england and i discovered i used to have to go to school in the south of england so i had to cross london and i discovered a specialist comic shop in london that would pay me i always used to pay a few pence for some of these american comics and i could sell them for a few shillings in this shop in london um and so I used to trade American comics <laughs> for, that I bought in Yorkshire in north of north of England to a shop in London called Dark They Were and Golden Eyed, which was about the first specialist comic shop in London. Uh-huh. Um, and my 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 biggest my biggest one was I got an Amazing Spider Man number one that I paid three old. Uh, three pence for um and i sold it for 10 pounds in london and i was you know i was a school kid oh Um, man for me that was just that was an amazing return and um but now i think i sold an amazing spider-man number one for 10 pounds ah yeah if only you kept it for another 40 years (laughs) yeah all all the original art that i've seen that conventions or friends of mine had you know if everybody had held on to the thing you know 2020 hindsight you know yeah there's uh exactly. one of those going to mark's collection soon nice nice that's nice. gonna go over to mark soon oh well well, so when I get back home, I would have to work out a deal with Kyle. So I've got some stuff that I think he wants, and I want his Batman 50. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your collection like? Have you got a, a collection of many uh, comic books, Hill? Oh, me? Well, I do. And in fact, I've got to start getting rid of them. Uh, There's just, I can't take Pick any. me, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to make some money on them, you know. Part of retirement is you need money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, I've got I've got some golden age because I bought a lot of uh, coal stuff, but I have more, you know, like Harvey Horror from the fifties, a lot of old Mad magazines when they were black and white, um, and then I've got a lot of Marvels and Silver Age things. So I just have to pull through that stuff. But um, the problem is I never took care of any of it. I just it was in the basement or the attic, and yeah, it got moldy or in the sun and you know but it's worth something and i'm sure there's you know there's comics yeah. worth, there's great collector you know whatever but comics there for readers i don't know about collectors mm. uh, maybe it's worth more than that wise but uh, i was just talking had a dinner with some friends and they you know we're talking about they were selling their books in, in the tent for their collections i have no idea in the right condition, but certainly the comics are the right comics. So, yeah. mm. but um, you know, I, I was never a huge collector. Uh, I would go to the here in Chicago was Larry's comic book store. Larry Sheriff was one of the guys that started the Chicago Comic Con, and uh, I would just look through the you know old old books and uh, I bought a lot of uh, old horror comics and Golden Age books, but often the covers were torn off. Or Again, chewed out by rats or something. Uh, you know, not the best condition, but I could look at comics drawn by Reed Randall or Hollywood or you name it. Yeah. A number of great artists. I would buy old heroic comics. I would have a one pager by Frazetta back in the forties. You know, that that stuff was great to find those things. Yeah. You know. Did you ever do any work for Mad? Do I have a what? What do you oh, work for Mad? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a short, sad story. Uh, yes and no. I ended up doing a two-page story for them. I didn't get published, but I don't think they liked it. And it, wasn't, it wasn't the coolest thing in the world, so it didn't lead to any more. But uh, I'm mad really wasn't the mad that I would have done for anyway. I mean, they literally don't put back all the gags in there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so... 
it, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of sad and mad the history, the recent history of mad, you know, like the relaunch and then the, them killing it again. I, it's all yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah, um, but you know, I think mad could have easily gone on had they stuck with it, but they did not. So, yeah. Wow, we're coming up to two hours now. Wow. All right. <laughs> That's it. I'm out of here. We'll let you get on with your, your day. <laughs> now I get Thanks to go, in. go lay, in, lay in the bed and watch TV. Yeah. Well, now day. you're officially an old fart like us. So, like I said, anytime you want to be an old fart with us, come on. <laughs> I want to come back and talk about anything else, then, you know, just randomly, then you're obviously welcome sure. to. Well, maybe, it. maybe we can do, you know, we can do a thing where we actually, if you want to talk about something specific, I could actually send you the yeah. scans in advance or Set it up. Oh, we'll work that out later. We don't have to talk about it. Either, so. Yeah. All right, guys. I was very specific. You were going to be the first guest if come hell or high water. So, or come <laughs> hill or high water. But Kyle, thanks for the yeah. hell and high water. And I'm glad you. you uh, I, I <laughs> held out the platitudes. I held out the platitudes, but I'm telling you, one of my favorite humans on the planet, dude. I'm <laughs> honored you came on here. I love your work. But I love your humanity even better. You're a hell of a dude. And I pray. <laughs> well, thank you, you stupid bastard. Thank you. Sorry, Kyle. It's good to know respect his mutual. I don't know how to handle that compliment, you know. Yeah. I can, I can mute him so he can't compliment anymore if you like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, you know. It was okay, Hill. Quite yeah. enjoyed it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Demateus guy will be better. Oh, he <laughs> he's a writer. He's got coherent thoughts. <laughs> Concepts, dynamics, angles, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, then. See you later, mate. No, it was a pleasure. Cheers. Kyle, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. See, you. See, see you later. <laughs> Give me We've, got more to chat. We've got a bit more to chat about after it. So, talk to All you right. soon, hopefully. Bye bye. Yeah. See ya. All right, then. <laughs> that was fun. That was interesting. That hey. was neat. That actually, I honestly, Ooh. I'm happy that that went two hours, even though I was struggling. So. I am physically <laughs> struggling now. I'd love to talk segments and do all that other stuff. But if you can't tell by my movements, I'm hitting the shakes the hard way. I have to go get horizontal and get on ice packs. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You got to do I'll that. Forget, I'll forget, Kyle. See you later, then. Yeah, segments yeah segments we can, we can, we, I think when we've got like a, a long time guest like that, we haven't necessarily got to do the other segments as well anyway. So I, I was going to talk to Mark about them as well. But we, we can talk about that offline. Yeah, so uh, like next week we're bumping back an hour, right? Uh, well, yeah, I was thinking I'd start at eight, but then yeah, yeah. next it's, week we're bumping back an hour trying to get people in. I don't know how many pros will pop in. I don't know how many other people can pop in through things, but people know how to find me. I know how to find them. Yeah. So people are yeah. looking for things. We'll try and get it up. Mark mentions people he wanted on, like. Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman. So while I'm sitting there messaging with them, I messaged Alan Moore and or Neil Gaiman and his agent. And I got a line towards Alan Moore. I may even pull that one off, but you know, I don't know. So I know Neil Gaiman has a message for me uh, said in the queue that he's going to read. So you're a Carl, talk, to, talk to us next time, man, because you're listening to you with that weird voice. He's just, he's just too crazy. Is it, is, <laughs> Go is, is the down. One out here. Is my speaker going out too? So, all right. You go uh, lie down, mate. Yeah, see you later. Then. You I, later. Just, I love a couple of minutes with uh, with uh, with Mark before, I, before we all go off and we will have our dinners. Uh, see you later, all right. mate. All right. Oh, okie dokie. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was actually. It was a nice yeah. guy. Yeah, he was. He had lots of, lots of stuff to say. I'll kick, I'll kick Kyle out of the studio because he's walking around with his phone still on. I don't want to see him leaking, like, take his trousers off or something like that. No, <laughs> So, yeah, we kind of, like, was going to – the original idea was that I was just, gonna, I was just playing Fallout and uh, Kyle come and I was talking about I wanted to just do a stream to show off my coin box, go for my coin boxes again. And, uh, and he took, took it and ran with it and said, I'm going to bring guests on and all that. I'm like, what? But so maybe we'll do a bit of that at some point. When we haven't got any guests, I'll show some – I'll go for my old coin boxes again. Yeah. 
And yeah, I come yeah. up with a couple of segments as well that I was going to, just because stupid bloody name popped in my head. So I'll show you the I'll show you the banners, and this is what we're going to do for the future. So if you have any ideas for this, so first up, by these facts I rule. It's a play on the old. <laughs> Coal cover. We just basically, we just come up with some some random facts. It can be random facts or some comic related kind of facts, that kind of thing. So if you want to like, if you've got any research or you know any really interesting yeah. nuggets of information, we yeah, can yeah, have yeah, that I can, I can as a little stuff segment. On that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Kyle wanted to do um, like a character focuses, like like I'm gonna pick a character and say what you remember about them and any kind of if it's ever had any influence on your life. Apparently the eternity character is some kind of influence he's had on me. He's gonna tell us about that probably next week, I should think. And also I've got this oh I just got rid of the comments. I've got um come up with an idea of just doing panels that please me was the was the idea. Oh panels that please me. Panels like that. that please me, yeah. And uh, I've got I actually I have actually done a video for them. I don't know if I should link to next week next, but it's over five minutes long. It's just basically some it's just like a little video. I don't know if we want, we want to I quite like that. That's good. I haven't seen anybody else do that. I, I, I agree yeah. with that. I, there's occasional panels I yeah. see because people always focus on covers. Exactly. Um, and I think, you know, you sometimes open up a comic and you go, oh, my God, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I like, I like that. It could be like a series. It could be I yeah, yeah, all yeah. these different reasons, like one panels or... I mean, you've got five minutes. I might play, I'll do the first one now if you've got five minutes to watch it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and watch it now, then. This is panels that please me, number one. Ah! Oh. Panels that please me. I can't see anything. I could just see you sitting in a chair. Hey, welcome to a new feature for my channel, Panels That Please Me. It's not a tricky concept to grasp. It's literally comic panels that make me happy for some reason or another. Be it great art or a cool fight scene, or in this case, some crazy dialogue. These panels come from Dazzler Volume 1, Number 4, from June 1981, with a shining script from Tom DeFalco and eye-popping pencils by Frank Springer. I just love some of the speech in this fight scene between our heroine and the fiend Nightmare. It's corny and over the top, but I think it's magnificent. In the story so far, Dazzler was kidnapped by Doctor Doom and sent to Nightmare's realm to try and retrieve the Merlin Stone. She's been assailed by all kinds of enemies, including a doppelganger, evil dark doppelganger of herself, which she's just managed to defeat just right now, and then Nightmare comes onto the scene. You shall have an eternity to ponder it. This game ceases to amuse me. I can dally with you no longer. He's decided to take his, uh, you know, take his own hand in proceedings and finish her off personally. My phantoms have served their purpose, sapping your strength and crushing your spirit. Now must you pay for daring to enter my dimension of dreams. So, you're the chief honcho. I've been waiting for you, sucker. Your words are strange, but their meaning is explicit. Indeed, I am the irrefutable lord of this shadowy realm, the almighty ruler of this plane of reality. I am Nightmare. I know all. You were mad to dream of stealing my Merling Stone. I didn't have much choice in the matter. Laughing boy's got the rock. Swell. A pity that, all the same, your soul shall be forfeit. The tentacles of Tomeray will drag you to the very depths of this world. Where your piercing screams shall mingle with those of countless others, till time himself has ceased to breathe. No! This girl is a single. If I want to sing in harmony... I join a choir. Impossible. You should be weak to the point of exhaustion. Yet you have blinded Tomeray and freed yourself. Nightmare, you and Dim have been playing me like an old 45. I've had enough. The continuous backgrounding of Nightmare's only human realm provides me with sufficient sound to give a decent account of myself here. Aye! You've started my faithful steed and unseated me. I have severely underestimated your will to survive, mortal. Believe it, chump, I once had a case of teenage acne. And you're nothing compared to that. Perhaps I was hasty in revealing my presence. No matter, a simple multi-figure illusion will serve to distract you while I retire to a place of safety. Dream on, doll face. My mutant light can easily dissolve your images. Stop! I cannot bear bright light! Your glowing intensity blinds my eyes and sears my soul! It... It's working. He's confused. Slowing down. The light barrage continues for many minutes, then... Enough! 
The Merlin Stone is but a trifle to me, a gaudy bauble. I shall gladly exchange it for your speedy departure. Soon. Do not exult in your apparent triumph, mortal. We shall meet again, for your dreams still belong to... Nightmare. I went for a lot of grief for this hunk of stone. Now if only do remember to get me the heck out of here. There you go, that was it. That was the dialogue I wanted to show you. It's funny, it's corny, it's uh, cliched maybe. Uh, yeah, love Dazzler's uh, dialogue as well as the megalomaniac supervillain. I suggest more people read megalomaniac supervillain dialogue out loud. It's a lot of fun. So, you know, try it sometime. I was actually doing this. I was reading this comic on the bed. Lisa was playing her game. I was reading that dialogue aloud just for a bit of a laugh. Uh, amusing myself, reading her the panels, having a gig about it. And that's when I saw this last panel that I'm sharing today. It's a fun line from Doctor Doom. And um, I told my girlfriend I was going to memorise this line for those times when she gets angry with me, which is not that it ever happens, of course, as I'm so lovely. But anyway, here's a great line from Doctor Doom. Any lesser man would have been stunned into senselessness or driven irreparably insane by such an awesome display of force, but not Doom. I have heard enough of your whimperings. You shall pay in full for your unmitigated haughtiness. So there you go. That's a line that I'm going to remember and use in future when my girlfriend gets angry with me. He'll probably make her more angry, but it's just a f silly line which uh, amuses me. It's a panel that pleases me. That's the whole point of this feature. Anyway, hopefully I'll be doing more of these in the future and hopefully you'll come back to see them. Cheers. Panels that please me. Okay, we're back. Uh, I don't, did you manage to see that at all? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. You say I, you I didn't mean, see it. it. I, I love that, right? Because I love that corny dialogue. Yeah, exactly. What, <laughs> what really amused me is Nightmare saying, oh, no, bright lights. Yeah. That's the thing that's going to defeat me. Well, the girl's name is Dazzler. Exactly. <laughs> that was fortunate. <laughs> that was very fortunate. Have you, have you read Dazzler? I've actually just first, I've only just finished the collection and I've been reading it like all week. It's quite cool. It's quite uh, cool. I like it. I've accidentally picked up quite a lot of Dazzlers, oh, yeah. but I've never read them. Um, I've right. got a couple of, I've got a couple of Dazzler oh. number ones. Right. Um, I've it's got a Dazzler. Cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the cover of Dazzler One, and yeah. um, I've also got. I've just picked up a first appearance in uh, X Men as well. Oh yeah, uh, I, my mate gave me a copy of that. I was well happy with that. My mate gave me it. That's like, well, cheers, mate. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, <laughs> nice as well. So I, I, I have, but I've never read it. <laughs> no, it's quite, it's quite, it's the, it's the usual kind of like, uh, you know, lots of silliness going on, lots of bad dialogue. It's like she's disco, but she's too late for disco because it's in the eighties that a comic came out, but she's meant to be disco. So yeah, kind of, I, I, I missed her own decade. They could make a. Yeah, I think they could make a go of Dazzler. It's one of those characters that you know they could do tongue in cheek. Um, yeah. Or they Why could not? just take it seriously and get some some mega star to play, you know. Um, she, she was in one of the films, wasn't she? But literally, only like, you just barely saw her. I think. She yeah, I think if you're going to do Dazzler, you've got to get you've you've got to go Madonna, Lady Gaga, or you know, <laughs> yeah, gosh, um, yeah, yeah, Avril Lavigne, or whatever her name is. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not big on the pop stars. Yeah, it's true. But it's kind of weird. Like she, her first fight, she like she fights. Enchantress, then she fights Doctor Doom, then she fights Galactus, or she goes to like Galactus what? kidnaps her. Then so she fights him. She's... Not... I know it's crazy. She's not taking on Pace Pop Pete, then. Yeah, or, no, um... no, it's all big, all big villains practically. There's, there's one like uh, underground figure she takes on, but it's, it's quite. It's I mean, Nightmare's pretty, pretty big. Yeah, yeah, it's quite tough, but obviously, it's kind of lucky that she wields light, and that happens to be his weakness. <laughs> so that, that's always handy. You want you kind of like you want your kind of like uh, your arch nemesis is to be all be like particularly weak against your power. That's always handy. <laughs> if you can, if no, you can make I, it. I mean I love I love all that type of stuff. I mean it it it, it makes me laugh. So as as I was watching, because you do quite good voiceovers. I try. So, <laughs> and, and <laughs> the dialogue just. It, it does make me laugh, and I like to laugh. So, you know, that's one of the things I like about. Com I love the corny stuff. 
Yeah. Right? The guy, oh, it's so God, over the top. Right. It's just like, like yeah. it's so melodramatic and, you know, megalomaniacal and that. But that, that, that line, because like, initially I was reading it to my girlfriend. Like, she was watching play one of her games on her computer. Yeah. And I was like, she was talking to me. So I started reading that loud. And, uh, this dialogue and that that line by Doctor Doom, see sure rat whimperings or whatever, uh, you will pay for your haughtiness or something like that. I thought I've got to memorize that line just for a just yeah. For I'm not sure that's going to work too well. At <laughs> no, home. I'm... no, but I wouldn't say it when, like, not in a real situation. But you know, no, she, she's got a sense of humor. She'll, she'll, she'll if she remembers what it's about, she'll uh, she'll appreciate it. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, other thing I was going to show, do as well is um, I did a load of videos, a load of videos of who, who's who videos. I took old who's who, um, uh, you know, entries from DC who's who, and I made little yeah. videos of them. So maybe oh. we'll, sh- we'll, do, we'll show one of them maybe as a segment in a future show. Yeah, um, yeah we'll see. See yeah, if, we, yeah, yeah. if we went out of things to talk about. But I think maybe we, could, we, could, we could play that and then people could sort of like talk about the character and what they remember about it and that kind of thing. I mean, one of the things I have about Kyle is... Mm. He has got some fantastic stuff. He said, he really yeah, does. Yeah. I mean, he was showing stuff the other night, in the, and I was going, oh, my God. You, <laughs> I, if I had this stuff, I could make about three years' worth of YouTube on it. And he's, just, <laughs> he's just throwing this stuff up. And he, yeah. I'm afraid his delivery is very... Quiet. It's too quiet because right? he's, in, he's, in, he's in a bit of pain and he quite a lot often. So... So like I mean, I saw you yeah. talking to him the other night, and he's he, the problem is he does sound and you, you he does sound as if he's making it up because it's just I know. what and he shows them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have the same thing. Like it's yeah, if anything like that, you know, if you've got too many stories after a while, it starts people start thinking this can't all be real. But yeah, you just you just pick up stories, you know, especially what he's done, like taking bands out on tours and stuff like that. So you do you do gather stories, don't you? I know, but the way he sells it is just too. It's just, it, it, you know, he's got some great stories, mm. but he doesn't tell them very well. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't put enough emphasis in. Doesn't, yeah, he's kind of say, yeah. I think it's, like when he shows his, his streams, he's very quiet as well. He's very quiet in his streams. I think there's a lot of he's got bad neck and all that kind of thing. So well, he's not well. I mean, he's, no, he's got two forms of exactly, cancer. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So um, that's the first. Sh- but he's a really nice guy. I love him. Yeah. A bit. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, well, he, he, he's his wife's obviously encouraged him to get into this thing to. Uh, he wants you know, some. He wants some tips. How can I tell them better? <laughs> yeah. So you know, yeah. Uh, well, I'll. I'm happy to talk to you about that because it's. Um, you've got such great stories and. If I had, is, is that your field of expertise? Because you, you, you like, do you do when your work? Did you do like kind of talking to people, like I, presentations I was, and that? I was, I was chairman of the debating society at my university, and oh, I've, okay. always, I've, I've always been able to talk. Yeah, uh, um, you know, and it's about engaging people. It's about you know, mm. getting. I, the, I was chairman of the mass debating society in my comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I mean, it's like um, the thing I like about you, Gray, is um, is when you go on a rant in yeah. um, cover slingers. That is great. And do you know who are you, you're gonna? You, it's um, <laughs> I used to listen to Just a Minute, right? right. And, yeah, and there was a guy called kenneth williams yeah um, yeah yeah i've listened to a few of kenneth williams just and he, well. he used to go off on a rant and go oh, i've come all the way here <laughs> from such and such street i don't need to listen to you guys you're idiots I, yeah. i'm an educated you know and when you go off one of your rants it just reminds me of kenneth williams going off on one of his rants yeah. and it is a, yeah, genuinely, it's really funny. I was going to uh, ask uh, Hillary if he'd ever listened to when he watched any Carry On movies because of his style, his style of humor. And I thought maybe I wonder if, if he'd ever watched Carry On. But yeah, I, yeah. I kind of tried to veer away from the rants now. I think people get, do get into them, but I'm kind of like a method actor. I, I, I literally, because I'm sort of saying these things and <laughs> pretending, trying to pretend to be angry, it makes me angry. You know what I mean? And after I'm like, I'm not actually angry. Why am I thinking I'm angry? Because I've been method acting and I've like, you know, you know, and I sort of like calm down, just don't get no, but what it does, 
I know, but what it does is it triggers your adrenaline and it triggers your brain, yeah, and you say yeah, some really funny. You say yeah, some, you say some weird. really funny stuff. Yeah. when you're in that mode but you yeah. know you're not thinking about it it's just it's just automatic and it comes out <laughs> yeah. um, and um that's the, to be honest that's the best bit of cover slingers yeah. uh, <laughs> you know i'm going oh it's, it's, i hope gray's gonna go off on a rant in a minute. <laughs> yeah i've tried not yeah. to the last couple of weeks what, was, uh, what was the what what, what was the one where you were doing, I don't know, missiles and um, oh, yeah, uh, hostile and projectiles, somebody, and he was yeah, showing a volcano, yeah, but a volcano, and, and, and you like, just went. <laughs> and, and the best, the best ones are where you're complete, you are completely right. I know, yeah. I, oh, I'm, I'm so half the time I'm completely right. I'm thinking, this, oh, this can't be right, what's going on? It changed reality to making. Make it not mean the same thing anymore, or whatever. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's all good fun. Is that, yeah. is that Mrs. Mrs. Mark in the background? Mrs. Mark is, uh, yeah, she's been very patient tonight because I've yeah. been on here for two hours, 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, so I stuff? better go. Yeah, I'm going to go have my dinner. I'll go, go do my dinner. Go warm it up. It's, it's already cooked. It's got a microwave it. But yeah, so, cool. So we'll see you next Wednesday. You will. I'll be in a different part of Spain. Hopefully, the reception will be better. Right. And we won't well, get stuck at all. I, I we to say we're going to probably maybe slightly like eight o'clock UK time because seven o'clock UK time. Yeah, I, my missus, It'll be nine o'clock here. Yeah, that's right. fine. I also talk to my missus at seven, like because we don't live together. She lives in South London, so yeah. I see her at weekends. So that's like my call time. So we we'll start at eight, and we might get a few more people in America because we start a bit later. You know, we we'll, we shall see. Anyway, nice drop of wine you got there, is it? Yeah, it's nice. a nice Spanish Rioja. <laughs> Spanish Rioja? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm off my Rioja. Anyway. <laughs> Talk to you yeah, soon, me mate. too. Okay, <laughs> cheers, guys. See you later. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Come back next week for more. And check out all the links below for everybody's stuff. Yay!